Yes, we're doing it and we're not even saving it for New Year's Day. We simply could not wait to speed our way over to Sega's mascot, play every last one of his games, rank them from worst to best, and of course, learn once and for all how quickly we'd yearn for our own deaths. Fairly quickly, as it turns out. Still, with the release of Sonic Origins, we thought it was a good time to take a look back at the Blue Blur's many adventures and share our opinions, so that you could dismiss them because they differ in any way from your own. Oh, <laughs> what fun. Sonic had his home console debut in 1991, created to be a true competitor to Mario and, by extension, Nintendo. Those who were around in those days know that competition between the two companies was fierce. The rivalry between Nintendo and Sega was like the rivalry between Coke and Pepsi. If Coke focused on making great products that are still popular today, while Pepsi drowned itself while taking a bath. That, that's the only way the comparison really works. Still, before it dedicated itself to making exclusively poor business decisions for the rest of time, apart from Yakuza and publishing Persona games, Sega was a genuine thorn in Nintendo's side. That was entirely thanks to Sonic, who single-handedly gave the company a mascot that people actually enjoyed. <laughs> Apologies, Alex Kidd. Your games were fine, it's just that we keep forgetting that you exist. In the 30 plus years that Sonic has been around, he has appeared in a lot of games, and they truly do run the gamut of quality. Mario has been in weirder places for sure, but Sonic has certainly been in worse places. Often for years on end, the poor guy. For this list, we tracked down every last one of them, played them, wept a bit, and ranked them from worst to best. Simple, right? You'd think so. Instead, we need to lay out a few ground rules. For starters, we aren't counting ports, remakes, or collections. That's good, otherwise you'd hear us talk about Sonic 1 around 40 times. We also aren't counting pachinko machines, prize dispensers, or anything along those lines. And while we did count mobile games in our Mario list, we aren't counting them here because there are at least 85 of the flippin' things, and that's if you don't count the ports. Mario had three. I'm sure you can appreciate the difference and the fact that we would like to sleep at some point within the next week. We also aren't counting plug and play games because this is hideous, LCD games because this is ludicrous, or browser games because this is rubbish. We also aren't counting fan games or anything else that wasn't officially released by Sega. I'd like to be very clear about all of these rules so that you don't ask why we didn't rank the Knuckles baseball Happy Meal toy. And that's all. So everyone grab your rings and let's rank them. Actually, wait, do not grab your rings, anyone. We didn't think that through, so please do not do that. I'm Ben. And I'm Peter from Triple Jump, and this is every Sonic the Hedgehog video game ranked from worst to best. Number 94, Sonic Jam, 1997, Gamecom. You know what was great? Sonic Jam, a Saturn compilation of the four main Mega Drive games. That's good enough to warrant a purchase, but toss in the fact that the games were completely rebuilt with new tweaks and features? Now you're talking. Oh, and there was a whole Sonic World mode, which was a completely 3D environment full of secrets to find and missions to complete. Ah, oh, lovely stuff. You know what wasn't great? Sonic Jam on the Gamecom. You might as well be playing it on a sheet of notebook paper. This one is neither a compilation nor a port, though we sure wish it were so that we wouldn't have to talk about it. On the bright side, it is easy to tell how many frames per second you're getting because you only need to count to three. Sonic Jam is just a handful of levels with superficial similarities to the originals. If you choose Sonic 2, you play through a crappy reimagining of Emerald Hill Zone. Choose Sonic 3, and it's a crappy reimagining of Angel Island Zone. Choose Sonic and Knuckles, and it's a crappy reimagining of Mushroom Hill Zone. If you ever wanted a compilation of Green Hill-like levels but wanted them to be barely playable and nearly impossible to see, then you're in luck, we suppose. Speaking of Green Hill, why did we skip Sonic 1? Because this game skips it too. Unlike us, however, it just hoped you wouldn't notice. There, now we officially have more integrity than Sonic Jam on the Gamecom. Number 93. Sonic Eraser, 1991, Mega Drive. What would a bad version of Tetris be like? Well, Columns. But what would a bad version of Columns be like? This 
my friends, exactly this. And it plows right through bad and ends up somewhere in the region of playable night terror. Sonic Eraser was a downloadable title released for Sega game Toshoken, which was a cartridge used with the Mega Modem and the Sega Mega Net online subscription. If you owned all of these things, you too could have been punished with Sonic Eraser. The game seems to revel in how little there is to it. Match two shapes and they disappear. Not three, not four, not five, but two. This means that, yes, you can create chains and develop a strategy, but that strategy will be about as deep as, well, Sonic Eraser. It's a puzzle game that doesn't even try to be interesting, and because both parties only need to match two shapes in order to stay alive, the matches drag on endlessly. Things get far worse when you hear the soundtrack. It's less music than it is a pile of sound effects layered over each other with no sense of melody, sounding like a song that space aliens might listen to while committing ritual suicide. On Earth, I'm not sure we have an equivalent. Possibly a digger full of nails and glass rolling end over end into a ravine. I'm fairly sure this only exists so that nobody can use the at least Sonic always has good music argument in good faith. Number 92. Sonic the Hedgehog, 2008. Didge. It's impressive that Sonic 08 could actually make us yearn for Sonic 06, but what can we say? We've been doing ranked lists for years now, and edutainment has taken its toll. Sonic the Hedgehog for the Leapfrog Didge, which must be the least promising collection of words possible, is a game about spelling. It involves platforming, yes, but ultimately Sonic is a cursor that allows you to select letters in the world's most overcomplicated game of Hangman. To be fair to the game, it doesn't look bad, and it featured unlockable remixes of tracks from previous Sonic games. On the downside, those remixes come out of a speaker attached to the Didge, which isn't great. And that's not just me picking on an edutainment console. The low-quality speaker causes genuine problems when playing the game. Because you're being asked to spell words, you have to rely on spoken instructions without subtitles, and the NAF speaker makes it difficult to hear the difference between similar words, such as letter and litter. Not much of a learning tool then. It's ultimately a Sonic game that runs like crap, isn't fun, and interrupts the action frequently so that an artificial voice can recite long-winded instructions to you through a speaker that sounds like it's stuffed full of socks. DLC was available in the form of additional word packs, unfortunately those don't appear to have been archived anywhere, so we'll just have to assume that all of the words I'd use to describe this game weren't included. Number 91. Sonic X, 2005. Leapster. In 2003, the Sonic X cartoon series made its debut. It ran for three seasons and covered multiple plot arcs, but none of them were about Sonic having to learn arithmetic. Nevertheless, that's the plot of the cartoon's only tie-in game, so we really hope you love addition and subtraction. As the game begins, Eggman introduces what he calls his greatest invention ever. Maths robots. Sadly, whatever brain disorder Eggman suffers in this game goes undiagnosed, and it's up to Sonic to rescue the world through the power of maths. Lest that accidentally sound too exciting, let me be clear that maths refers to touching the numbers you are told to touch and solving basic equations. At first, the game seems superficially interested in celebrating Sonic's history. Its first level is Station Square from Sonic Adventure, and its second level is Angel Island from Sonic 3. Then the game just whips up some forgettable Eggman level for the third, and the game stops because the developers got tired of their own idea. Oh, I suppose we should talk about how it controls, but the Leapster looks like this, so you already know how it controls don't you? The most interesting thing about it is how long it arrived after Nintendo realised that plopping its mascot into terrible edutainment games was bad for the brand. Here, well after the rest of the world learned that lesson, Sega couldn't resist the allure of a few quick bugs. Number 90. Waku Waku Sonic Patrol Car, 1991. Arcade. We would like you to indulge us for a moment. Look at this. Gaze upon it, pause the video if you must, and soak it in. This is what you have made us review, because it has a video game inside. This thing, which looks about as pointless and unassuming as a little car or aeroplane for children that you might find outside of a corner shop, has a video game inside. And, with no regard for our feelings, our sanity, or our very souls, you've made us review it. This game takes two minutes to finish. It genuinely took longer to write this entry about Waku Waku Sonic Patrol Car than it took to complete it to 100%. It was a no damage run too, not to brag though. You steer with the wheel and hit buttons to either activate the siren or jump. There, I've also just given you a full walkthrough. The story is that Sonic is a policeman officer. Gotta go fast, more like gotta go the speed limit. Rules for me, but not for thee. Hey Sonic, you class traitor. Anyway, while patrolling the streets, he finds Eggman, who is comically murdering people and blowing things up. Jump into him a few times and 
he just sort of jogs away. Arrest him, Sonic! You wanted this job, now do it! But no, Eggman gets off with not so much as a warning. You're a disgrace to the uniform, Mr. the Hedgehog. Number 89. Sega Sonic Cosmo Fighter, 1993. Arcade. It's another children's ride slash video game, but this time it has actual gameplay. It only took Sega two years to hit upon the idea, but credit where it's due. The primary goal of Sega Sonic Cosmo Fighter is to get children to climb inside of a little spaceship and deposit all of their spare change. The secondary goal is to shoot at Eggman as he flies through space, or something, we don't care, and neither do you. Look, what matters is that this time you get to move around and shoot things like you do in actual games that are worth actual money. Eventually, you chase Eggman down for the final encounter, and he pilots a gigantic mech with a goblin face on it. Why not? There isn't much in the way of challenge or strategy, but you do get ranked at the end on how well you did, and that's really it. You can play the entire game in around three minutes, but you'll actively regret wasting your money for the rest of your life. Oh, and let's just get this out of the way while we're here. We're not counting the Sega Sonic Popcorn Shop. It's a snack machine. Yes, it has a little interactive display with what can generously be referred to as a minigame, but we need to draw the line somewhere. If you want our full review of it, you turn a crank. Or you don't. Either way, popcorn comes out. 10 out of 10 would popcorn again. Now leave us alone. Number 88. Sonic's Schoolhouse, 1996. PC. In 1991, humanity dodged a bullet when Sonic's EduSoft was quietly cancelled. It was a collection of educational minigames featuring a hedgehog who eats chili dogs, and let's just take a moment to consider how utterly bizarre that entire concept is. Flash forward five years when humanity was a little older, a lot less spry, and unable to dodge the bullet called Sonic Schoolhouse. You don't play as Sonic in Sonic Schoolhouse? Of course you don't. That might have accidentally led to some small degree of fun. Instead, you choose some hideous computer-generated anthropology anthropomorphized abomination and wander around a schoolhouse answering questions on chalkboards. It's targeted at children between the ages of five and nine, which is good because no ten-year-old would be caught dead playing it. You answer questions by chasing down letters and numbers bouncing around the hallway. Sega's then-CEO Shinobu Toyoda described the game thusly, Sonic Schoolhouse is like Doom for kids, but instead of being in dark hallways fighting bad guys, kids are in a brightly coloured 3D schoolhouse challenging their friends to see who can answer questions first. In other words, it's literally Literally nothing like Doom, but it is very much like a tall mountain of cat feces. And yes, the game did have split-screen multiplayer, which must have been great for the two kids who tried it and then never spoke to each other again. If you thought Mario's edutainment games were bad, well, okay, they were, but this is bad too. May we move on, please? Number 87. Sonic the Hedgehog, the screensaver, 1996. PC. The line between games and digital entertainment products that are not games but sort of fall into the same bucket is hazy. At least that's what we're allowing ourselves to believe, otherwise I'll be extremely cross at Philip for making me talk about Sonic the Hedgehog the screensaver. Philip. It comes with some extra gubbins, such as Sonic wallpapers, sounds and icons that you could use to customise windows, but the main appeal is, of course, the screensaver, which is a screensaver. Those used to serve the important purpose of preventing images from being burned into your screen forever, and Sonic the Hedgehog the screensaver accomplishes this by letting you watch Tails meticulously scrub away some ancient promotional art. Sorry, but I think I'll stick with the flying toasters. And if you have any idea what we mean by that, it's time to get you to bed, Grandad. Admittedly, having promotional art is what passed for high quality in 1996, and some of the images were even more rare, having been created by Naoto Oshima for in-house Sega magazine Harmony. Very few fans would have ever seen those illustrations before, so that was a nice bonus. If you didn't own Sonic the Hedgehog the screensaver but are experiencing deja vu, it's possible you saw these images as bonus content in Sonic Jam on the Saturn. But that didn't come with those super sweet Windows icons now, did it? You thought not. Jog on, Sonic Jam. Number 86. Wacky World's Creativity Studio, 1994. Mega Drive. It would be so easy to just pretend we didn't make eye contact with Wacky World's Creativity Studio. Sonic's name isn't even in the title. He's on the box, but so is Echo the Dolphin. Surely we could just pretend that this is an Echo game, promise to include it on our eventual every Echo game ranked list and then never actually make one, right? Everybody would win. Sadly, I'm stuck with it. This is quite often considered a Sonic spin-off and also 
God hates all of us. Wacky World's creativity studio is, well, we suppose it's a creativity studio, but I'm glad the title made that clear because the game doesn't. You control Sonic, who rides around in a UFO, which I'm sure has all sorts of fascinating lore implications. If this is reminding you of Mario Paint, that's because both games have a lot in common. For instance, Mario Paint comes with the SNES mouse, and Wacky World's creativity studio came with the Sega mouse. Mario Paint had great music, and this game technically has music too. Weirdly, for a creativity studio, there isn't much room for creativity. You basically choose a backdrop and position some digital colour forms wherever you want them to stand. They're animated, which is nice, but you can't actually do much else beyond change the colours of the sprites and manipulate the music. My personal favourite way to manipulate the music is to turn it off. Mario Paint wasn't all that robust, but Wacky World's creativity studio certainly helps us appreciate it a lot more. Number 85. Sonic the Hedgehog's Game World. 1994. Pico. Can you believe we used to gloss over edutainment games in these lists? Oh, the folly of youth. These things are always weird and sometimes charming in their own special way. They are also, however, uniformly rubbish, and they give us excuses to come up with synonyms for poo-poo. Sonic the Hedgehog's Game World is indeed classified as an edutainment game, and like many other edutainment games, we have no clue what anyone is meant to learn from this. It's a minigame collection, and one must wonder if Sega simply dumped it on its edutainment-focused Pico in the grounds that it was garbage rather than because it had any educational benefits. There's a racing game, there's a basketball game, there's a whack-a-mole game. Hey, did you know that carnival games are educational? We didn't either until Sonic the Hedgehog did his level best to convince us. According to the Sonic Wiki, there are evidently a good number of localization differences. Games featuring gambling, fortune telling, fantasy violence, rock, paper, scissors, and other non-educational elements were omitted from the North American version, they say. Wait, so this was originally even less educational? What, did it actually actively siphon existing knowledge out of your brain? Of course, you're wondering how it plays, right? Like utter plops. Like absolute steaming plops. It was a stylus game released in 1994, how else could it possibly play? The only thing it taught me was to welcome death. Number 84. Tales and the Music Maker. 1994. Pico. We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams, so begins Ode by Arthur O'Shaughnessy, and I'm glad it does, because it means we have to come up with 13 fewer words about Tails and the Music Maker. Oh, 46 fewer now. We're ranking this above Sonic the Hedgehog's Game World on the strength of its novelty alone. That was a profoundly soulless minigame collection that seems to have ridden into existence on a bolt of pure apathy. Tails and the Music Maker is a bit more focused, and it puts some kind of effort towards justifying its presence in the world. Do you think we should have rank these the other way around? Fine, we could live to be 500 years old and we wouldn't ever find the time to care. This one is still full of minigames, but they at least share a common theme. There's musical chairs, there's breakout, there's pinball, only now they involve music, and by music we mean shrill bleeps and bloops from the bucket of metal shards that the Pico calls a speaker. There is perhaps some loose educational value here. Tales can show you how to play a few notes of simple songs and then you repeat them. Granted, that's rote memorization more than it is learning to play an instrument, but good lord, it's something. And who hasn't wanted to learn à vous dire je maman from a literal freak of nature? Yes, we know we'd recognize it as Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but what can we say? The traditionalists. Number 83. Sonic Freeriders, 2010. Xbox 360. Considering how far Sonic had sunk by 2010, did he really think it was wise to strap himself to the anchor that was the Kinect? That thing never worked. We're convinced that any time it did seem to accurately register an input, it was an accident. And we can assure you that no human being experienced the horror that was Kinect and thought, I bet this would be a great way to control Sonic the Hedgehog. Let's be fair, a racing game is by far a better fit for the peripheral than a platformer would have been. God knows what we'd have been asked to do with our bodies in order to execute a spin dash. Sonic Freeriders were on you leaning and using your arms to control your racer, which sounds simple enough, but even that is too confusing for the Kinect, which can't work out if you're trying to grab an item or turn 90 degrees and crash directly into a wall. We can gab all day about whether or not it looks nice, whether or not the music is good, whether or not it has enough content, but the fact is that Sonic Freeriders didn't work. Playing this game is like shouting commands at a dog whose name you don't know and which doesn't have any legs. It's an embarrassing marriage between a property that had no credibility and a peripheral that was about as welcome in the home as a dead Dead skunk, and, well, it deserves its place on this list. Number 82. Sonic Brain Ranking, 2013. Arcade. Sonic Brain Ranking exists. 
Well, technically, it doesn't anymore, but it did. That's about all we can say for certain. There's no way to play it that we were able to find, and only a small amount of footage and photos circulate. A few games on the list were considered lost until a ROM or a disc image turned up somewhere, so maybe in a few years' time we'll know more. For now, however, we can't even begin to understand this thing. From what we can gather, nine players would compete while the tenth would read questions aloud. Seems like that person would have had the smallest amount of fun, but who knows? Maybe the questions were truly terrible and reading them was preferable to being forced to think about about them. What kind of questions? We don't know. Sources simply describe it as trivia, but there seems to have been sliding puzzles and logic questions as well, so we can't really say. We don't even know if all the questions were Sonic-themed. Whatever this game was, I'm sure that me and my nine closest friends would have hated every second of it. Sonic Brain Ranking was created for Tokyo Joy Police, a sort of department store slash game center. It must not have been very fun, though. In its five years of operation, very few people have deigned to share photos, information, or their stories of play. It. We're going to assume that we aren't missing much. Number 81. Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood 2008 DS We refuse to believe that any human being has completed this game. We tried, dear viewer, we really did, but Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood is criminally boring. Sonic has been a laughing stock for... Well, let me check here. Right. Statistically speaking, Sonic has been a laughing stock for longer than most of you have been alive, but even his worst games tend to have some degree of charm. Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood, however, is distressingly dull, and we doubt that anybody who tried playing through this whole thing didn't die of boredom around the 10 hour mark. Perhaps most puzzlingly, this game was made by Bioware. Yes, Mass Effect, Dragon Age, Knights of the Old Republic, that Bioware. Why they decided to make a Sonic the Hedgehog RPG of all things we can't understand. How it turned out to be this brain-meltingly boring, we understand even less. Navigating the overworld is tedious, the conversations are tedious, the minigame-style combat is tedious, the soundtrack is absolutely appalling, and yet, and yet, it has a 74% average on Metacritic. This game, which we can personally assure you is worse than being stung by a scorpion, is three quarters perfect, apparently. Maybe it's just us. Maybe we are the ones who are wrong, and Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood is a misunderstood masterpiece. All we know is that this game managed manages to take a bonkers concept and turn it into the most padded, mindless experience possible. That's not technically a crime, but we demand the immediate imprisonment of everyone involved. Number 80. Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric 2014 Wii U. We assume that a few of you clicked this video only to see whether this or Sonic 06 would rank lower. As far as we're concerned, there's not even a question about it. Both games similarly mortified critics, but Sonic Boom has far less merit. Yes, less merit than Sonic 06, we know what we said. Sega allegedly chose Big Red Button due to its co-founder Bob Raffi, who worked at Naughty Dog on the Crash Bandicoot, Jack and Daxter, and Uncharted franchises. We're fans of those games, but it's rather clear that none of them are anything like Sonic the Hedgehog. What's more, focus groups told Big Red Button that the game should be slow because it's difficult to keep up with fast things. Somehow, entire groups of people who knew nothing about why anyone liked Sonic were shaping the game's creative direction. Could things get any worse? Oh, you bet they could. Sega also pushed the studio to rush development of the game and hit them with the demand that it be a Wii U exclusive after it was already in development for more powerful hardware, leading to a lot of scrapped work and friction between the companies. The result was a buggy mess of a game that couldn't even compare to Sonic 06 in terms of its music, ambition, or unintentional comedy. Sonic 06 was terrible, but it's easy to see what Sega wanted that game to be. Nobody knew what they wanted Rise of Lyric to be, and so we ended up with a whole lot of nothing. Number 79. Sonic Labyrinth 1995 Game Gear Sonic Labyrinth only takes around 30 minutes to finish, but fret not, it will ensure that those are the most irritating 30 minutes of your entire life. The concept of the game is that Eggman has snuck into Sonic's house during the night and replaced his shoes with slow down boots. Da da da! For some reason, he didn't take this opportunity to reenact the ending of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest instead. Anyway, that's just an excuse for Sonic Labyrinth to have a slower pace than any Sonic game we'd seen yet, and while there's nothing wrong with slow games, it's odd to design one around a character who famously got a go not slow. You can still spin dash, but with a tiny screen it's impossible to know what's ahead, making it far too easy to collide with things you need to avoid. It's so easy to lose control, in fact, that you probably shouldn't spin dash unless you've memorized every inch of every level, and if you have done that, why have you done that? Instead of 
you know, doing anything fun, you were tasked with exploring various isometric mazes and collecting keys. Why? Flip you, that's why. It's full of repetitive, empty environments that make it difficult to know where you're going and the isometric perspective makes everything feel needlessly confusing. Right down to being named after an infamously hated zone from the first game, Sonic Labyrinth seems to give you every reason not to play it. Who are we to go against its wishes? Number 78. Sonic X Vapor 2012 Xbox 360. Sadly not a game about Chris Thorndike vaping, Sonic X Vapor is an advertisement. Sort of. In 2012, shoe company Nike launched the My Time Is Now campaign, which consisted of a number of interactive elements across different forms of media. Some of these contained hidden content, most of which has been lost to the ages. A genuine loss for fans of shoe adverts there. One bit of hidden content was Sonic X Vapor, a game accessible through a video on Nike's YouTube page and through ads on the Xbox 360. So far as we can tell, the game was identical on both platforms, but we admit to not being Sonic X Vapor scholars, and you are welcome to correct us. It was an endless runner based on Sonic's Mega Drive years, though it allowed you to kick footballs and perform two-thirds of a triple jump. The game also had checkpoint posts that didn't do anything. It's impossible to continue after death, so thanks anyway. It's certainly not a high point in the Hedgehog's career, shilling for sneakers he'd never wear again, but he did the same thing in Sonic Adventure 2, so at least he's not an inconsistent sellout. The game itself manages to be exactly as fun as saying Sonic starred in an interactive shoe advert. You play until you die, and then you can pay your high score with your friends who beat you up for talking about Sonic X Vapor. Then you move on to better games. In fact, let's all do that right now. Number 77. Sonic Shuffle 2000 Dreamcast Fans rarely speak of the Sonic Dreamcast trilogy because they prefer we pretend it were a duology instead. Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2 are good, right? And people love the Dreamcast, can't we just leave it at that and let everybody be happy? No, we cannot. Because between those two games, Sega released a bag of old teeth that they found on the bus and called it Sonic Shuffle. On the surface, Sonic Shuffle should work perfectly well. Even if it's not great, a Mario Party style game with Sonic characters is prime spin-off material. It was even designed by Hudson Soft the same company that made Mario Party games of that era. So what went wrong? Well, how much time do you have? Just about everything feels poorly considered. Mini games and boards are underexplained, leaving a lot of important information unsaid and forcing you to learn by failing. And while randomness is a big factor in party games overall, the fact that you'll already be struggling to understand what to do means that Sonic Shuffle might as well be selecting winners at random and saving us the time. The worst part? The AI, even at the easiest setting, cheats. If you have better cards than it has, it will steal them to ensure that it always has the upper hand. Yes, Mario Party usually has AI that is too easy, but that doesn't mean that the solution is for it to shove you down and steal your dinner money, Sonic Shuffle. Number 76. Sonic Drift, 1994. Game Gear. The first of many Sonic racing games, Sonic Drift didn't see a release outside of Japan until much later in various collections. Fortunately, the rest of the world wasn't missing out. The game features Sonic, Tails, Amy, and Eggman racing in circles to accomplish something very important, I'm sure. Much of the game's lack of depth can be attributed to the meager hardware of the Game Gear. That's fair, and it explains why we won't find a 20-character roster, an arsenal of items, and complicated track layouts. But surely Sonic Drift could have included something more than driving in six different circles. At the very least, it could have tightened up the controls, which are nowhere near responsive enough and work against the game's limited draw distance. The on-screen map helps, but not in any kind of way that makes the experience more fun. The most creative thing in the game is the fact that each of the six tracks is based on one of the main zones from the first Sonic the Hedgehog, but even that feels more like a concept than a feature. The tracks don't feature enemies, level hazards, or music from those zones, it just changes the background. The lone saving grace is that you can play the game with a friend via the gear-to-gear -gear cable, but even then, that's only worth it if you can't think of anything more fun to do with your game gears, such as clubbing each other to death. Number 75. Tails Sky Patrol. 1995. Game Gear. There's a whole trilogy of Tales games out there, and they're worth playing if you've ever wondered what it's like to witness the end of the world. This game is sometimes referred to as a scrolling shooter, but that's only because scrolling on its own isn't a genre. It's a strange, poorly designed oddity that defies classification, which is good, because if it did belong to a class, that would mean that there were more of them. The game sees Tales squaring off against the villainous Witch Cart. If you ever thought Eggman was a stupid name, please take a moment to absorb Witch Cart. And by squaring off against, we really mean 
endlessly floating towards. Tails moves ever forward through a whopping five levels, each more annoying than the last. The game is rarely clear about which stage features are deadly and which are ornamental. Hazards and enemies move more quickly than Tails does, and trial and error is often the only way to progress. It's impressively irritating, really. This game also never left Japan in its original incarnation, so Sega probably knew it was a bit of a stinker. Playing it with as forgiving a mindset as possible, it's a clunky novelty that can be comfortably completed twice in the course of a lunch break. Back then, on the power-hungry Game Gear, we'd have called it a waste of batteries. Now, it's just a waste of time, which isn't all that much better now that we think about it. Number 74. Sonic Athletics 2013 Arcade our two favourite things in the world are Sonic and Athletics. Only joking, we've always hated one of those things, and this list is quickly causing me to hate the other. We're probably not the target audience then for Sonic Athletics. Actually, we're definitely not, because we don't live in Japan or frequent Tokyo Joypolis. The game consists of eight actual treadmills which you use to control the speed of your character. As expected, the events are speed-based, though at least one requires jumping. Thankfully, you do that by pressing a button and not leaping into the air above a moving piece of exercise equipment. Is the game fun? If you like running on treadmills, then I'm gonna say yes. If you don't, staring at an animated gif of Sonic's arse while you do so probably won't win you over. Unless it does, in which case I'm not judging you. I'm just more of a Vector the Crocodile guy, you know? Also, just to get it out of the way, we aren't going to cover Sonic Ghost Shooting on this list. It's often listed as an arcade game, but it's more of an attraction or activity. At the very least, it's not a video game. You sit in a little cart and shoot at projections of ghosts as you pass by. We don't live anywhere near this game either, but it seems like we can play it while sitting on our behinds and eating crisps, which therefore means we'd enjoy it far more than Sonic Athletics. Peter? Number 73, Flicky, 1984, Arcade. We're including games based on and named after Sonic's friends, so we might as well count Flicky. He predates Sonic, but I'm sure many of your friends predate you, and you don't hold that against them, so there. Flicky was the result of Sega wanting to create a game that could rival the popularity of Mappy. And we assure you that we're the first people in almost 40 years to have uttered the phrase, the popularity of Mappy. During development, the game went through several names, including Flippy and Bus. And please, as a favour to me, never name your children's video game mascot Busty. As Flicky, it's your job to find baby birds scattered about the level and guide them to the exit. Deliver more birds, earn more points. As expected from a score attack game like this, the difficulty ramps up quickly and the game keeps looping until you run out of lives. It's easy to see exactly how it inspired the larger Sonic the Hedgehog series, right? <laughs> Not right. This game has the square root of Captain Jack Squat in common with the larger series, but Flicky does cameo in many of the games, particularly in the early 2D adventures that saw Sonic rescuing animals at the end of stages. Flicky also appeared in Sonic R, Sonic Rush, and most notably, the very next entry on this list. Oh, stay tuned for the next 10 seconds. Did we cover this game only so we'd avoid dozens of you forgot Flicky comments? <laughs> yes. Yes, we did. Now leave us alone. Number 72, Sonic 3D, Flicky's Island, 1996, Mega Drive and Saturn. Hello again, Flicky! Known as Sonic 3D Blast in North America and Soniku Suridi Furiki Erando in Japan, we can all at least agree that whatever it was called, this game sucked on toast. As you can tell, it has a lot in common with Sonic Labyrinth. It even has a similar goal, tracking down Flickies rather than keys in each level. F flick, flick keys. No, never mind. It looks and plays better, yes, but it's still not very good. The game increases the emphasis on platforming, which is not easy from an isometric perspective. It also isn't helped by the disorienting visuals, and the fact that it's often hard to see where Sonic's shadow is. The repetitive colours and tile work made sense on the Game Gear, which could only handle so much, but here it just makes things feel unpolished, as though you're playing through placeholder levels in a beta version of a game that's nowhere near finished. It's not completely fair to fault Sega for releasing a subpar Sonic game on the Saturn. That console had released two years prior, and it still hadn't shifted a single unit. The company needed a new Sonic game for the system, so we understand why they released this, even if it wasn't quite up to snuff. 
What we don't understand, though, is why they released it the same month for the Mega Drive as well, meaning nobody needed to buy a Saturn in order to play it. Feels like you might have missed the point of your own plan there, Sega. Number 71, Sonic Blast, 1996, Game Gear. Despite the name, this has nothing to do with Sonic 3D Blast, unless you count the fact that they're both rubbish. If you do count that, though, then Sonic Blast has something in common with a whole load of Sonic games. This one pulls inspiration from Nintendo's Donkey Kong Country, but that inspiration, sadly, didn't run any deeper than its character models. And even then, it doesn't compare favorably. Donkey Kong Country's characters still look quite good today, whereas Sonic Blast looks like somebody scanned in some Polaroid photos of clay models and then compressed them to the smallest possible file size. The game seems designed to answer the question, what if Sonic's Game Gear adventures were even stiffer, more annoying, and looked terrible? It's packed with exclusively bad ideas, the most serious of which was the impulse to zoom the screen in even closer than usual. The biggest problem with the Game Gear games was that you already couldn't see far enough ahead of you. Sega's solution, bafflingly, was to show you even less. There's also a wealth of lag, hit detection issues, and poor programming, all of which are on particular display in the Blue Marine Zone. It's a game that's destined to make a terrible first impression, and the best possible outcome is that you leave it at that. There was a Master System port of Sonic Blast in 1997, yes, a Master System port well into the Saturn's life cycle, but for whatever reason, it was only released in Brazil. On behalf of the rest of the world, we're sorry, Brazil. Number 70, Shadow the Hedgehog, 2005, GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Xbox. Was this the first truly terrible Sonic game? Well, it came out after 17 of the games we've already discussed, so no, clearly not. It might, however, have been the first clear, irrefutable evidence that the franchise was in decline. Shadow is a strong character. That's something you might find hard to believe if you've played Shadow the Hedgehog, but it's true. Of course, he completed his entire arc in Sonic Adventure 2, so was it worth bringing him back for more story? This game answers that question with a very loud no, backed by sounds of screeching guitars and an exploding orphanage. There's little story here that was worth telling, and none of it is told well. In fact, it's incomprehensible depending upon which path you take. You can side with one faction during a level and then begin the next level at war with them. You can be partners with with a character who, for then no reason, suddenly challenges you to a boss fight. Much ink has already been spilled about how needlessly dark the story is, but the bigger problem is honestly that it isn't even told coherently. You can even get conflicting answers on how Shadow has returned from the dead, which is the central question of the game. The weirdest part? Mechanics such as the light speed dash and triangle jump, which failed so often in the previous games, work just fine here. Of all the Sonic 3D games that needed better programming, it was Shadow the Hedgehog that got it. That's disappointing and insulting in equal measure. Number 60 Nice, Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games Arcade Edition 2016 Arcade. How likely are you to watch the Olympics? Whatever your answer, surely you'd be more likely to watch them if the participants were dinosaurs, robots, and hedgehogs, right? Right? It's a weird concept for a minigame collection, I'll admit, and maybe an even weirder concept for an arcade game, but here we are. As you might expect, Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games Arcade Edition is an arcade version of Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games. What? What, we're not, we're not padding out this entry, we promise. We have loads to say. Loads! Such as, well, it was released in Japan and the US, but seemingly nowhere else, unless we overlooked it, which we might have done, but honestly, we've got a lot of these Olympic games to talk about, so we need to strategically spread out the observations we make. The game is understandably similar to the console version in terms of content, but it does have a few unique events of its own. Hammer throw, 100 meter hurdles, long jump, and trampoline are... Things that you can do here that you can't do on the Wii U. Are you glad we committed to reviewing each one of these games individually now? We're not, but you might be. The Japanese version had 
aim I, I may card functionality which stored your records and allowed you to compete for spots on national leaderboards okay whatever you say philip apparently you could also unlock characters that way which was certainly a welcome treat for all those diehard fans of mario and sonic at the rio 2016 olympic games arcade edition Number 68, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020 Arcade Edition 2020 Arcade. Remember during the Mario list when we basically have to stop dead every couple of minutes to scrape together some words about yet another Mario Party game? Well, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games is this list's equivalent. If you'd like to get a snack whenever you hear us say those words, you feel free. We wish we could do the same. This one did get a wider release than the 2016 arcade game, coming to Europe and Australia as well as the USA and Japan. It was an unprecedented gesture of goodwill that brought the world just a little closer to harmony. I'm lying, we had a pandemic that year and nobody was going to the arcades no matter where they lived. Thanks anyway, Sega. Compared to Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games Arcade Edition, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020 Arcade Edition has a slightly different title format and a smaller amount of truly unique content, with most of it being similar to events in the Switch version. And one nice bonus of having the Switch version is that you're allowed to keep it. The new unique events here are for the 1964 mode, 110 meter hurdles and 10 meter diving. I'm sure you'll agree, those are fantastic events. Or terrible ones, we honestly can't say we've ever thought about either of them before and we'll probably never think about them again. Still, it's fine, it plays well, it's a weird game and we are already so very tired. Number 67, Sonic Battle 2003, Game Boy Advance. Sonic Battle is a very bad game. Yes, some of the art is nice. Yes, Emerald is a welcome addition. Yes, his ability to learn moves from opponents is an interesting gimmick. And no, none of that changes the fact that Sonic Battle is a very bad game. The main problem is that it's a fighting game that combines 2D characters with 3D environments, which never feels right. Lining up an attack in three dimensions when the characters exist in only two is not a fun prospect. The game has generous hitboxes and accounts for the fact that it's difficult to know if your attacks will connect, but that's an admission of a flaw in the game's design rather than a correction for it. We suppose it's nice that the game cheats on your behalf rather than lets you struggle with its own problems, but we'd rather just play a better designed game that didn't have those problems. We're tempted to say the game shines in multiplayer, but that would be overselling it. It's more accurate to say the game is marginally less awful in multiplayer. The Game Boy Advance was perfectly suited to cartoony platformers, and by this point, Sonic knew that damn well. Why we got a Sonic game in a genre that wasn't suited at all to the GBA is beyond us. And you know what? Good. Keep it far, far beyond us. There are some things we'd rather not understand. Number 66, Sonic Boom Shattered Crystal, 2014, 3DS. Rise of Lyric single-handedly tanked the Sonic Boom name, which is unfortunate because not everything that bears that name is terrible. The handheld games are better, the television show was fun, and the character designs weren't that bad. If they'd gotten a stronger debut, they'd certainly be held in higher regard. Not those blue arms though, oh no, those are clearly worth getting upset over. Shattered Crystal is a step in the right direction. A much larger step would have been preferable, but hey, it's something. As in Rise of Lyric, you switch between various characters to progress, only the stages are 2D here and things feel better, more refined and more familiar. The game is more playable, which is good, but it still isn't as fast or thrilling as Sonic games typically are, taking a more explorational approach that never quite gets fun. The levels are far too long. You can finish an entire Game Gear game in the time it takes you to fully clear some stages here. Also, you need to revisit them multiple times with different characters to collect everything. That's a tall ask for a game that, you know, isn't that great. It works, but it's not engaging and it still works wasn't what anybody wanted. The developer for this one was Sanzaru Games, who must have impressed Sega by making both the worst Ratchet and Clank game and the worst Sly Cooper game. Why Sega didn't stick with Dimps, a company that made good handheld Sonic games, 
is a mystery for the ages. Number 65. Sonic the Hedgehog 2006 PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 Well, what can we possibly say about this? It's higher than we expected it to be? Perhaps. It's as terrible as we remember? Oh, certainly. Humans only sometimes make out with animals in it? Yes, that is true. But really, everybody knows that Sonic 06 is bad. Everybody knows why it's bad. Nobody doubts that it's bad. It always has been, and Sega should be ashamed of itself. It was developed to celebrate 15 years of Sonic the Hedgehog, but all it really did was bury him alive for the next 15. The series has yet to shake the stink of this one, however much it's tried. The soundtrack is great, of course, and some of the visuals are good, but beyond that, what is the nicest thing you can say? It, it's difficult to accidentally decapitate yourself with the disc? Yeah, that's, that's quite a nice thing to say about this. From terrible design, to a worse story, to copious glitches, to endless loading screens, to gameplay features that literally do not function, Sonic 06 is an appalling product made by a company that had no excuse for releasing it in the state that it was in. Apart from greed, so it, yeah, I suppose they had one excuse. The cherry on the top is that it was released on the same day as a port of the first Sonic the Hedgehog game to Game Boy Advance, which was also a broken, unplayable mess. It's just that it was a broken, unplayable mess of a game that everyone had previously loved. Yes, the Hedgehog's future and his legacy were tarnished on November the 14th, 2006. Happy birthday, Sonic. We hope you like crap. Number 64, Sonic the Hedgehog 2, 1992, Master System. When you think of what defines Sonic 2 in relation to its predecessor, two things quickly come to mind. Tails and the Spin Dash. The Master System version of Sonic 2, however, doesn't have those things. At least, not really. Tails does appear, but he's kidnapped by Eggman at the start of the game. Except he also appears by your side in the zone intros, implying that he is with you. In or out, Tails, make up your mind. We'll get to the Master System version of Sonic 1, but for now we'll just say that it was limited by the hardware and made an admirable attempt to craft a game that suited it. Here, however, there's almost nothing that's admirable, and even less that's any actual fun. The game is a frustrating gauntlet of blind jumps and platforms that are sometimes impossible to distinguish from the background elements. The bosses are artificially difficult, and level gimmicks are implemented so poorly that they feel like intermittent punishments. Funnily enough, this version of Sonic 2 beat the Mega Drive version of Sonic 2 to shelves. Not by much, fortunately, so very few people were likely to believe that this was the true sequel. That game's earliest release was November of 1992, while this one plopped out in October. Pity all of the grandmothers that year who remembered that little Susie asked for Sonic 2 for Christmas, but couldn't recall which version. No, actually, pity little Susie even more. Number 63, Sonic and the Secret Rings, 2007, Wii. How can we rebuild Sonic's reputation after the legendarily awful Sonic 06? How about a motion-controlled Wii game? We can't imagine many people would have felt that to be the correct next step for Sega's mascot, but all of the people who did were on the development team of Sonic and the Secret Rings. Oh, and it's for some reason based on the 1001 Nights. Well, the only two or three things from 1001 Nights that anyone recognizes, anyway. Reviews weren't great, but in our opinion, they were far too kind. And the fact that this represented a step up from one of the literal worst games in history should not have been met with as much relief as it was. A box full of wasps would have been better than Sonic 06, but that doesn't mean anyone should buy one, does it? The game plays horrendously. There's a reason most of the best Wii games either used very basic gestures for the Wiimote or relied on its pointer functionality. The motion sensitivity was nowhere near reliable enough to build entire games around. It'd be like playing Spyro the Dragon by pelting rocks at a jewel shock. It's difficult to work out who this game was even for. Fans of Arabian Nights who wished the stories involved Eggman and prefer their games to be impossible to control, maybe? If so, kudos for knowing your audience, 
But is this really the best way to treat your struggling mascot? Number 62. Sega Sonic the Hedgehog, 1993. Arcade. Sega Sonic the Hedgehog is less of a platformer than it is an isometric sprint game. Is there a better term for that? Well, if so, I'm perfectly fine with not knowing it, thank you. It was a multiplayer arcade game in which each player had a trackball and an action button, and the goal was to outrun whatever hazard was making your life hell in any particular level. Due to the oddness of its controls, it's nigh on impossible to play properly today. Indeed, perhaps it is more fun with a trackball. A filthy, grimy trackball that somebody's dripped chocolate and snot all over before it was your turn to play. Yes, that was probably much more fun. The game is a straightforward adventure without much to recommend it, and its biggest claim to fame is that it introduced two sidekicks for Sonic, Ray the Flying Squirrel and Mighty the Armadillo. Gee, if only Sonic had other yellow and red sidekicks, they could have appeared in this game instead. Okay, yes, I'm mostly joking. Sonic 3 didn't debut until the following year, so we can forgive Knuckles for sitting this one out, but why not include Tails instead of Ray? Regardless, Sonic's two fair-weather friends wouldn't share a playable appearance with him again until 2018's Sonic Mania Plus. Weirdly, nobody missed them while they were gone, and nobody's going to miss them now that they're gone again either. Otherwise, well, the animations are nice and the music is good, and Sega has never re-released it, which we think also qualifies as a positive. Number 61. Sonic the Hedgehog Spinball 1993, Mega Drive, and Sonic Spinball 1994, Game Gear. Yes, we are covering both versions in one entry, but hear me out because we have a very good reason for doing so. We hate this game and would like to forget about it as quickly as humanly possible. Sonic the Hedgehog Spinball for the Mega Drive is a fine concept. One of Sonic's most notable features is that he can curl up into a ball, and some of his most memorable stages involve pinball flippers and bumpers. Why then is Sonic the Hedgehog Spinball such a load of horse apples? Well, mainly because it just doesn't feel good to play. The physics are both stiff and inconsistent, and while it's possible to get a handle on the individual quirks and gimmicks of each table, it's never really much fun to do so. Some of the music is memorable, and it's a solid idea for a game, but it's quite clear to see this was rushed through development in order to plug the gap between Sonic 2 and Sonic 3, and not because anyone involved was particularly passionate about the idea. The Game Gear version is not the same game, but since the main differences come down to the specific arrangements of pinball tables, we couldn't really warrant talking about the game for two successive entries. To be honest, we could barely stand playing both versions, let alone talking about them. If you're wondering which one to pick up, just go with whichever one is cheaper. You'll regret your purchase either way, so just regret a smaller one, I suppose. Number 60. Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 1 2010 PlayStation 3, Wii, and Xbox 360 Sonic fans have appended the unofficial title of The Real Sonic 4 to everything from Sonic Mania to Sonic Advance to Sonic Adventure, and that's because they're desperate to remove the real, real Sonic 4 from existence. Like the Phantom Menace before it, Sonic 4 was advertised and anticipated as a glorious return to a beloved trilogy, but ended up disappointing many fans. They even both have Episode 1 in the title! Still, there is one crucial difference between this game and The Phantom Menace. Nobody, under any circumstances, ever talks about this game. And we don't blame them. It's literally more fun to plan one's own funeral. Sonic 4 Episode 1 is a far worse retread of the original Sonic the Hedgehog. Much has been made of the fact that the physics aren't true to those found in the Mega Drive games, and that's a fair criticism, but an even more fair criticism is the fact that they aren't even true to themselves. Sonic frequently glitches out or reacts improperly to things, as though the developers couldn't decide on how anything was supposed to work in the first place. The entire thing feels like a low-effort fan game. It's stiff, it runs poorly, the levels are appallingly designed, and it looks positively hideous. It's even shockingly low on creativity, relying on lesser retreads of old stage ideas. Remixing familiar concepts would work well in Sonic Generations and Sonic Mania, but those games were made with love. 
This game barely feels like it was made at all. Number 59, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games 2008 DS. The portable version of the first Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games game is, to be fair, what anyone should have expected. It's a mini-game collection, like the Wii version, only this time it's portable. We're not giving it extra points for low ambition, of course, but we also should acknowledge that there wasn't all that much in the way of expectation to begin with. The game also looks significantly worse, but we'd be lying if we said there weren't some degree of appeal in the thick polygons. It's charming, even if it did make all of the characters look like arts and crafts projects. We will say there's notably less appeal in the reliance on touch controls. We get it, of course, it's a collection of mini-games on the DS, of course it will have touch controls, and the Wii version certainly wasn't without its own gimmickry, but dragging, flicking and tapping gets old very fast when all you're doing is helping our beloved Vector the Crocodile do gymnastics. It's a competent game, and that might be enough for some people, but we certainly can't pretend it's much more than a weird oddity that, as a series, eventually lost its weird oddness. If you've always wanted to see Mario characters and Sonic characters compete in the Olympics, and you've always wanted to see that on the go, this is right up your alley. But we'd like to keep our alley just a little cleaner. Thank you very much. Number 58, Sega Sonic Bros, 1992, Arcade. Sega Sonic Bros is often referred to as being one of Sonic's many unreleased games, but actually was released in Japan. Briefly, it was location tested, and evidently it performed poorly enough that Sega quickly recalled the machines. So here we are writing about another falling block puzzler that just happens to have some Sonic imagery slapped over it. It's okay. It's clear enough why it didn't grab the public's eye. I mean, how could it? It's an extremely superficial experience that can be rather fun in multiplayer, but you could say that about almost any puzzle game. Instead of simply matching colours, you need to create rings of the same colour which will remove any of the blocks contained within the ring. ROMs of the game do circulate, so while its time in the rising sun was brief, it's at least not lost. You can try it yourself and marvel at the fact that yes, the blocks look like Sonic. Actually, they are Sonic, all of them. You'd be forgiven for assuming the differently coloured hedgehogs were different characters. I mean, that's usually the case, isn't it? But this game doesn't even have that much creativity. It's just Sonic, Red Sonic, Yellow Sonic, and eventually White Sonic. If you absolutely need to play a falling block puzzler with Sonic in it, this is a better option than Sonic Eraser. But then again, so is losing a knife fight. This is not the worst game Sonic's ever been in, but it might be the one with the least imagination. Number 57, Tails Adventure, 1995, Game Gear. The best of the Tails games, simply because it's the least psychologically destructive of the Tails games, Tails Adventure is okay. In fact, if it weren't on the Game Gear and had been developed by anyone other than the people who made Coca-Cola Kid, it might have actually been good. Tails works well in a slower-paced puzzle platformer. It wouldn't make sense for Sonic to methodically comb through environments, and it wouldn't make sense for Knuckles to track down upgrades rather than bash his way through obstacles. So Tails is a perfect fit for this particular approach. Sadly though, the design isn't great. You can only hold four items at one time, and you must choose your loadout before entering a level. If you didn't bring the item you need, you have to physically walk all the way to an exit, return to Tails' house, choose four different items, enter the stage again, travel to the obstacle, and see if you brought the right thing this time. If not, repeat until you've tried everything. Oh, and there's always the chance you actually need to be in a different stage entirely. Oh, what fun! At times, there are flashes of potential, but the Game Gear is not the right system for large, sprawling mazes that must be explored multiple times. It's impossible to see what's coming, let alone remember where everything is. Tales Adventure is a good concept that falls down in its execution. Still, good concept puts it well above many of the other things we've seen so far. Number 56, Sonic Drift 2, 1995, Game Gear. The original release of Sonic Drift was exclusive to Japan, but Sega made the decision to bring its sequel westward. They certainly chose the better game to receive a wider audience, but that's not to say that Sonic Drift 2 is great. In fact, it's mainly just 
more. That in itself is fine. Yes, we'd love it if Sonic Drift 2 compared favourably to Mario Kart or even Sega's other races, but that's the world of fantasy. And in case you haven't been paying attention these past few years, we emphatically do not live in the world of fantasy. What we got instead was a beefed up version of the same game, providing more content without significantly improving the overall experience. There are new items and the roster is expanded. A bit. You can now race as Metal Sonic, Knuckles the Echidna, and Fang the Sniper, everyone's favourite animal. Most importantly, there are more tracks, and they are not all circles this time. Oh, Sega, with this actual attention to track design, you really are spoiling us. The Death Egg track even looks like Eggman's beautiful face. So if you've ever wanted to leave skid marks in his moustache, have at it. Many of the tracks even have environmental hazards or other tweaks, which make them feel far more distinct than they did in the previous game. All in all, it's a perfectly competent little racer for the Game Gear, even if it's not all that memorable. Sonic racing games got much better from here, but Sonic Drift 2 was evidence that Sega was willing to improve. Number 55. Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games 2016 Wii U Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games was the second game in this sub-series on the Wii U, and one might expect that it would have built and improved upon its predecessor. That's what happened on the DS and Wii, after all. It can take time to get used to new hardware, and with a series like this, it's reasonable to think it might not reach its fullest potential right out of the gate. And yet, this one doesn't feel like it's trying very hard. The game lacks content, with fewer events overall and no dream events. What are dream events? Well, you'll hear about them later in this list because they are things that people actually enjoy. We're not keen on referring to developers as lazy, that's very, very rarely the case, but this doesn't feel like a decision that was made in order to benefit the consumer. What is here is serviceable. Some of the new events, such as boxing, are fun, but none of them justify another game on the Wii U, especially one that takes a notable step back in quality. Scandal very much pending, but we do wonder if the failure of the Wii U made Sega take this game less seriously. Rather than invest a load of resources into trying to make it a must-have, they slapped together something passable and called it a day. We certainly don't know for sure, and we can't blame them if that's correct, but we can be just a little bit disappointed. Number 54. Knuckles Chaotix 1995 32X Knuckles Chaotix is the closest Knuckles has ever gotten to having a game all to himself and the fact it's an unloved, largely forgotten mess might be the reason he's been stuck on the sidelines ever since. That's not entirely fair to the Echidna, as the many problems with Knuckles Chaotix have nothing to do with him and everything to do with the fact that it's a strange concept executed poorly. The game began development as Sonic Crackers, and was intended to star Sonic and Tails tethered together in the video game adaptation of the Defiant Ones that we've always wanted. Eventually, Knuckles got the spotlight, and he's regretted it ever since. It's not terrible, but it is an ill-conceived misfire in just about every way. The levels are huge and sprawling, past the point of tedium, and pseudo-randomization means you'll hop between them without any clear sense of escalation. Most of the partner characters are fine, but there are some who exist just to hinder you. Also, in what feels less like a decision than a concession made because the game keeps breaking, there's a button dedicated to snapping your partner back into place. On the bright side, the music is often great and the visuals are unforgettable, looking like LSD took some LSD. But the fact that this was the only Sonic game for the 32X, and the related fact that Sega has never re-released it, probably suggests that they would rather we forget it. And I will start right now. Number 53. Sonic Dash Extreme 2015 Arcade 
Sonic Dash Extreme is an arcade version of the mobile game Sonic Dash, and Sonic Dash was a Sonic version of Temple Run. So basically, Sonic Dash Extreme was like playing Temple Run on an arcade cabinet. Except you could actually play Temple Run on an arcade cabinet, so Sonic Dash Extreme has absolutely no purpose whatsoever. Yay! To be fair, Sonic Dash was fine, and if all you wanted to do was speed around for a few minutes, sidestepping hazards and collecting rings, it was an adequate time killer. There was a little bit more to the experience than that, but it was still just Temple Run, let's not fool ourselves here. There doesn't seem to be much difference between between this and the phone version, which is free, so it's probably best to save yourself the money and fiddle with that for the 12 or so minutes it will take you to get bored. Also, if you download the game from Google Play, and we want to be very clear here about the fact that we are not joking, you can unlock Andronic the Hedgehog, a cross between a Sonic and the Android logo. It's very scary, and we hate it. Strangely, the arcade game seems to have only released in the UK. We're not sure how many cabinets are still out there in the wild, but if you know where to find one, do let us know in the comments. We will meet you there, and we'll try and beat each other's high scores. Just just wait for us there by the cabinet. We, we will join you eventually. We promise. Number 52. Sonic the Fighters, 1996. Arcade. You'd probably expect a concept as weird as Sonic the Fighters to be the result of some executive at Sega who sat down, crunched numbers, determined that Sonic and fighting games were both profitable, and then demanded that the developers get to work. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Character designer Masahiro Sugiyama was bored, so he imported some rough 3D models of Sonic and Tails into a build of fighting vipers. Yuji Naka apparently saw employees playing with it and thought, hey, why not? And so development began on a game in which Sonic and a very small number of his very strange friends would beat each other up for pocket change. Isn't game development magical? It's not a bad game, it can't be with Fighting Viper's DNA in its blood, but it's a very strange and fairly shallow one. The characters also have a bouncy quality that's difficult to describe, which makes the fighting feel like little is at stake. If the rubbery characters can contort themselves right back into shape, does the fight really matter? We realise that we are dangerously close to arguing in favour of realistic hedgehog viscera though, so we will relent. A port of the game to the Sega Saturn was announced, but nothing ever came of it. According to the Sonic Wiki, no explanation has ever been offered for the port's cancellation. I'm sure that that's true, but come on, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to work this one out. Number 51. Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games. 2016. 3DS. Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games for the 3DS is not to be confused with Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games for the Wii U, or Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games Arcade Edition. I'm just joking, it's easy to confuse it with those, and with every other Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games game. There's not even an easy way to say that, this whole sub-series is a mess. By this point, previous Mario and Sonic at the Olympics games games had covered most of the possible minigames that one could wring out of the Olympics. As a result, this release ends up seeming less in interesting and less impressive. Just about everything feels like a lesser retread of what we'd seen in the handheld games before, feeling far less fresh and far too familiar at once. It's not bad, and everything works just fine, but it doesn't really feel like much thought went into this one, particularly when compared to its predecessor on the same system. If you ask us, the main selling points are the football and golf games, which are decently robust. We're not sure if it's worth picking up the game just for those things, and Mario Golf World Tour does exist if you're looking for a great version of that particular sport on the 3DS, but they are nice bonuses for the overall package. We just wish that package were a little easier to recommend. Number 50. Sonic Pinball Party 2003 Game Boy Advance you know, it would be so easy for us to ignore this one. It's called Sonic Pinball Party, yes, but unlike Sonic Spinball, it's not a Sonic game with pinball elements. It's a pinball game with Sonic elements. Even then, it also has elements from Knights and Samba de Amigo, so if it weren't for the game's title, we wouldn't have to talk about this at all, right? Not quite right, sadly, because Sonic Pinball Party has a story mode and it's a Sonic story. How many pinball games have story modes? Not that many, and Sonic Pinball Party makes it clear why. Nobody is going to write a good story that involves repeatedly playing the same few pinball tables. And even if somebody did write a good story, it would necessarily be frequently interrupted by playing the same few pinball tables. Have fun slapping the balls around and racking up high scores, which ends up freeing your pals from Eggman's mind control for what I'm certain are scientifically valid reasons. The physics are fine, they're nothing earth shattering, but considering the hardware, they're more than serviceable. There are only three tables and a few mini games, and none of them are especially impressive or memorable. 
pinball. If you absolutely need a pinball game on your GBA, Sonic Pinball Party is perfectly fine, but if what you need is more than five or six minutes of fun, it's probably best to keep looking. Number 49. Sonic and the Black Knight, 2009. We. Have you ever wanted to see Sonic meet King Arthur? No, of course not, that would be stupid. But have you ever wanted Sonic to be King Arthur? What's that? That's even more stupid. Oh, well, might want to steer clear of Sonic and the Black Knight then. It's a strange concept. It's not one that was inherently doomed to fail, but it's also not one that the game works very hard to make worthwhile. The plot seems to be an excuse for extended cutscenes in which the characters all dress up in period garb and talk to each other for far too long about things that don't really require discussion. You know, just what everyone wants from a character famous for moving quickly. The gameplay is improved from Sonic and the Secret Rings, if only because you can now move Sonic with the nunchuck. You are no longer confined to motion controls. But don't worry, dear friends, motion controls still rear their unwelcome head with the sword fighting being controlled by waggling. It's fine. We suppose God knows it's far from the only waggle to kill things game on the Wii, but remember when Sonic ran fast and jumped on enemies to kill them? Who on earth saw that and thought it would be a better idea if he came to a dead stop to do some fencing? It's nice that you can unlock Shadow, Knuckles and Blaze as playable characters, but all three of them deserve a much better game. Number 48. Sega Superstars, 2004. PlayStation 2. Hey, look, it's the eye toy! Considering how much Peter and I enjoy Sony over at Triple Jump Towers, we very rarely have reason to talk about the eye toy. That's good, because if we drew attention to it, people might realize that it was basically an early connect, only it worked. So Microsoft had even less of an excuse than you'd previously thought. Sega Superstars was a collection of mini games for the device, spanning properties such as Crazy Taxi, Billy Hatcher, and Virtua Fighter. As with any collection of motion controlled mini games, the quality varies, but fortunately, we're ranking Sonic games on this list, and we get to focus all of our attention on that one, in all of its glory. It's not bad, to be clear. In fact, it works quite well. The iToys motion tracking allows you to move your arms around to control Sonic as he runs through a long pipe, collecting rings and chaos emeralds. There's not much else to it, but the game is a serviceable enough diversion. It didn't hold our interest for long, but as part of a larger package, it doesn't really need to. If you complete the game on each difficulty, you unlock the ability to play as Shadow, which itself is basically just another tougher difficulty. It's a decent bonus, and the game certainly isn't terrible, but it would be nice if Sonic's lone PS2 exclusive was something a bit more substantial. Oh, and there's also a Chow Garden, which is good news for the one person on Earth who ever enjoyed Chow Gardens. Number 47. Sonic the Hedgehog, 1991. Master System. In 1991, Sega released Sonic the Hedgehog for the Mega Drive. We'll get to that, but we're focusing on another release from a few months later, Sonic the Hedgehog for the Master System. It's not a port, it's an entirely new game built from the ground up for the weaker console, and that's good, but it's still quite flawed. There is absolutely no sense of speed, with lag and frame rate issues making things feel even slower. The levels are bland and forgettable, stage types include vertical climbs and auto scrollers, the excellent layered design of the original game is missing completely completely blind jumps, dot the landscape, and the Eggman fights completely lack challenge even without rings. And yet, we kind of like it. Not very much, but we admire what it was able to accomplish. As a platformer in its own right, it's not bad. It mainly pales in comparison to the 16-bit version. Interestingly, this game is an early example of something that would contribute to Sega's downfall. This was released for the Master System three years after the launch of the Mega Drive, and over-supporting multiple systems would eventually pose a serious problem. By 1996, just five years later, Sega would be supporting the Master System, the Mega Drive, the Mega CD, the 32X, the Game Gear, and the Pico. Six consoles at the same time. Today, we have roughly enough room on the market for three consoles, but in 1996, Sega believed that it could sustain six. Sega's ambition was one of its defining aspects, but even ambition needs limits. Number 46. Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, 2007. We. Let's be clear, nobody wanted this. We didn't want this, you didn't want this, neither Mario nor Sonic wanted this, but starting in 2007, we've been treated to Olympic tie-in games featuring the former rivals, and it's possible that the sub-series will outlive us all. It's a strange idea. As a peace offering between Sega and Nintendo, it's fine. As a one-off novelty, it's weird enough to succeed on oddity alone. As a long-overdue official crossover between two gaming titans, however, well, 
nobody wanted this. A platformer? A racing game? Some kind of weird head-to-head -head puzzler? Just about anything would have been a better fit than an athletics competition between the fastest thing alive and a man who sweats just getting out of bed in the morning. It's a minigame collection on the Wii, which means you'll be doing this however long you decide to play, but it works about as well as can be hoped, and at the time there was at least a small thrill in seeing Amy Rose and Waluigi competing in the world's most important sporting events. Frankly, we doubt that they put in the training and are only competing as some kind of publicity stunt, but that's just one man's opinion. Mario and Sonic would have a more welcome crossover in 2008 with Super Smash Bros. Brawl, and maybe that would have seemed even more special if the two hadn't already met here for a few games of competitive table tennis. On the bright side, things did mostly get better from here. Number 45. Sonic Rivals 2006 PlayStation Portable Nintendo's handhelds have had no shortage of Sonic platformers, but Sony's handhelds were far less lucky. The PSP, for instance, had only three Sonic games, Sonic Rivals, Sonic Rivals 2, and the Sega Mega Drive collection, which contained ports of Sonic and Sonic 2, as well as Flicky. Remember? We all agreed that we are counting Flicky. Sonic Rivals is a platform racer in which the objective is to reach the end of a stage before your opponent. A few 2D Sonic games have included competitive modes, but now it's the entire point. Sadly, the characters all play similarly to each other, despite the fact that they've had different abilities in the past. That was certainly done for balancing reasons, but just as certainly the developers could have designed levels around multiple abilities rather than giving everyone the same basic moveset and repetitive obstacles to overcome. Aside from their special moves, playing the game as one character feels identical to playing it as another, which defeats the purpose of having a varied roster. The levels themselves are also extremely lifeless, and we'd have trouble believing that they held anyone's attention for very long. There's the potential for a great platform racer in there, and Sonic is indeed a good fit for the idea, but Sonic Rivals is an empty, almost soulless experience. The sequel does improve upon this idea, but not by enough to really matter. And hey, speak of the devil! Number 44. Sonic Rivals 2 2007 PlayStation Portable. We're blitzing right past this pair of disappointments and we'll never speak of them again. To be clear, neither game is particularly bad. They're very boring, utterly pointless, and bereft of merit, but with a history like Sonic's, that still keeps them far from the bottom. Sonic Rivals was not the game anybody wanted from the series on the PSP, but fans of course bought it in the hopes that it would encourage Sega to release a proper game. Sega responded by making Sonic Rivals 2 and turning up at each of their homes to say, nah 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 nah, blow raspberry, oh sorry. <laughs> The game does make some welcome improvements. It has more characters, and their special moves even make them feel more unique. Sometimes. Hey, it's better than nothing. There are also more modes, and the stages are better designed overall. The voice acted cutscenes are a nice treat for anyone invested in that deep Sonic Rivals lore, and now the special gauge fills up as you collect rings, giving you something to focus on other than the finish line. It's better, but is it good? Have you not been paying attention? No, it's not good. The variety is absolutely welcome, and there was some additional effort invested here, but this still isn't up to the level of quality we'd have hoped for in the first place, let alone a sequel. These games didn't have much potential, but they still fail to live up to what they could have been. Number 43. Sonic Rush Adventure 2007 DS Sonic Rush Adventure is a downgrade from 2005's Sonic Rush in just about every way. The stages are less interesting, collecting materials requires either perfect play or repetitive grinding, and the soundtrack is… look, we are going to sing the praises of Sonic Rush's soundtrack soon enough, so let's just say that this is nowhere near as good. There are a few standout tracks, Hello Plant Kingdom and Coral Cave, but it's such a step down that the loss is tangible. There's also an increased reliance on performing tricks in the air and capping them off with a finishing move which isn't as fun as simply moving through stages as quickly as possible. There are also dull seafaring sections which absolutely slaughter the pace. Nobody could have believed that Sonic games would be improved by long sequences of moving slowly from one part of the world to another, and yet here we are. And the between level missions commit the cardinal sin of making the game longer without adding anything to the experience of playing it. What's more, they removed the previous game's autosave feature, which is a decision that could only have been made to irritate everyone. Then there's Marine, the game's new character who never shuts up and speaks with an exaggerated Australian vernacular, with a Sheila, Struth, or Shrimp on the Barbie in every damned line. She promises Sonic at the end of the game that she'll see him again, even if she has to cross dimensions to do it. And Let's all thank the Lord that she's bad at keeping promises. Number 42. Sonic Boom Fire and Ice 2016 3DS The last of the Sonic Boom games is the best. It does not achieve greatness, it doesn't even really achieve goodness, but it does achieve 
fineness. Fire and Ice really does try. It allows for exploration of levels, but it no longer ties collectibles to progression, leaving you free to, you know, play it like a Sonic game. The main gimmick is switching between the fire and ice elements, which is required to overcome certain obstacles. It works well, actually, and can be done on the fly so that it doesn't interrupt the flow of gameplay. None of the elemental puzzles are difficult, but we don't think they were intended to be. We get the sense that it was just one more way to challenge players to keep their momentum going, and in that regard at least, it works well. It's barely more than a wrinkle in how the game is played, but it is something. And that was it for Sonic Boom. Nobody wanted it, nobody misses it, though it did reach some levels of competence by the end. We hope to do the same one day. Interestingly, Sonic Forces is said to have begun development as a sequel to the much-loved Sonic Generations, bringing classic Sonic, modern Sonic, and Sonic Boom Sonic together. Due to the fact that Sonic Boom was received like a slap in humanity's collective knackers, Sonic Forces featured a custom avatar instead. Brave of Sega to admit that literally anyone could create a character better than they could at this point. Number 41. Rad Mobile, 1990, Arcade. Yes, we're stuck including this one because if we didn't, every other comment would be, didn't you know that Sonic's first official appearance was in Rad Mobile? Sorry. You'll just have to try to make us feel stupid another way. Rad Mobile is not a Sonic game. It does, however, feature Sonic consistently all throughout gameplay. See? There he is, dangling from the roof of that car as though his little hedgehog cries for help were never heeded. Okay, that was more morbid than we intended to get. It's just a plastic charm of Sega's mascot, even though he wouldn't get his first proper game until the following year. For 1990, Rad Mobile looked fantastic, and the changing times of day and weather effects were impressive. There are even police who will attempt to pull you over. If if they do, the game says that you are under arrest, but this is not what being arrested looks like, or at least it shouldn't. Are we assigning too much significance to Sonic's appearance here? Yes, but it really is a major part of the game's appeal. When it was ported to the Saturn in 1994 as Gale Racer, Sega not only retained Sonic but added more charms, including Tails, Amy, and Eggman. That's nice, but I'll never forgive them for leaving out Ray the Flying Squirrel, and we will not rest until every last Sega employee is… oh, they did include him. I… wow. We didn't expect that. Right, we're sorry we ever doubted you, Sega. Moving on. Number 40. Sonic R, 1997. Saturn. Sonic R occupies a strange place in Sonic's history, as it manages to be exactly as good as it is bad. It's an impressive balancing act. Many of these games are boring. Many of them are only notable for their strangeness. Some of them, of course, are good. But Sonic R is worth seeking out simply because it exists. It's a racing game, as you can surely tell, but nearly all of the characters are on foot. That's fine, except that they control as though they're in vehicles, with braking and acceleration and wide turning. Of course, characters who control like vehicles is fine when you're actually racing. It takes a bit of mental effort to reprogram your brain, but it does work. Then, all at once, it doesn't work, because Sonic R introduces platforming exploration and collectathon elements within its races. It's not enough to finish first. If you intend to unlock all of the content and complete the game fully, you will need to seek out the various hidden trinkets at the same time that you win the races. It's a strange mix that we do not want other games to attempt, but this one handles it quite well. It is possible to explore the secret area collect all the goodies and finish first. It's not easy, but it's also not oppressively difficult. It's a strangely satisfying challenge in a game that really shouldn't work as well as it does. Sonic R isn't great, but it's impressively far from being bad. Number 39. Mario and Sonic at the Sochi 2014 Olympic Winter Games. 2013. Wii U. The subseries made its HD debut with Mario and Sonic at the Sochi 2014 Olympic Winter Games, and we couldn't be happier. Sorry, no, no, misread that. And we can never be happy again, that's it. This was the precise point at which the world collectively realised that Mario and Sonic would keep competing in the same Olympic events until our great-grandchildren are buried in the cold, cold ground. So. Hey, it's fitting that it's another game about the Winter Olympics, at least. In terms of the visuals, well, they are improved. Are they improved by enough to matter? I'll say no. It's not for want of trying, but cartoon characters have looked great in video games for many years. They're sharper in HD, yes, but since these critters were never meant to look real, the upgrade really isn't as important. Like many Wii U exclusives, Mario and Sonic at the Sochi 2014 Olympic Winter Games relies heavily on the gamepad. Previous titles were no strangers to control gimmicks, but staring down at the gamepad is significantly 
infinitely less fun than watching the action on your television. Also, many of the minigames still require the Wii Remote, so you'll be swapping back and forth between controllers, sometimes even during the same event. It's by no means impossible to do that, but it also isn't very much fun. It's a needless complication to a series that had, up until that point, been a simple experience. If you really need a minigame collection on your Wii U, you could do worse, but that isn't really saying much. Number 38. Mario & Sonic at the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020 2019 Switch Boy, remember the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo? Ah, oh, what fun we had. All of the sporting events and Olympians. The medals. Can't forget the medals and all of the, uh, yeah, just all of the general Olympic joy. Oh. My mistake, we had a pandemic that year and nobody was doing anything ever. Yeah, weirdly enough, this game came out in November 2019 and the actual 2020 Tokyo Olympics never took place. Tokyo did belatedly host the games in July 2021, but to this day, Sega has not come around to my house to fix the box art of my copy. It's like they don't even care about their customers. Unbelievable. Sega even wanted this game to celebrate Tokyo's history with the Olympics, including retro-styled 1964 events based on the previous year that Tokyo had hosted the Summer Games. It was a nice idea, scuppered slightly by the fact that the modern-day 2020 events didn't happen at all. Still, the game is fine, but it could have been much better. A lot of the content feels stale after having been featured in the previous games, and while the 1964 events are great, we can't pretend that they have much depth, which we suppose is fitting since they're two-dimensional, but you get the point. There are also fewer dream events, only three in fact, making this feel less inventive than its predecessors. It looks good, but it feels as though the series was starting to run low on ideas. Number 37. Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, 1993. Mega Drive. It certainly seems like we're always having to find new ways to talk about Puyo Puyo on these lists. Now, let me be clear, Puyo Puyo is excellent, but the games kept getting released under different names, so we keep having to rank them all over again. This particular version is a reskin of the 1992 Mega Drive port of the original Puyo Puyo arcade game. It also, interestingly, ties into the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon as opposed to the video game series. You can tell because it features characters exclusive to that show, and also because Robotnik's head is obscene. It's your job to manage blobs of varying colours, positioning them so that one match will trigger a long chain of other matches, and you'll bury your opponent under a veritable deluge of slime. Alright, that sounds disgusting, but it is fun! It is a bit less fun if you're playing against the CPU, though, as those opponents are incredibly fast and difficult. If you want a game that's going to ease you into its mechanics, too bad. Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine will quite gladly curb stomp you into submission should you dare challenge it. Weirdly, the later ports to the Game Gear and Master System might be a better place to start. They're the same game, but they have a unique puzzle mode that will help you learn the best way to set up chains for maximum blobbage. And now that I've said maximum blobbage in this video, I would very much like to move on, please. Okay. Number 36. Sega Superstars Tennis, 2008. DS, PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, Wii, and Xbox 360. Are we stretching by including this game? Yes and no. No, because Sonic and Pals are definitely the focus, even if the title doesn't bear his name. But yes, because it's still just a tennis game that happens to have a lot of Sonic stuff in it. We did want to include it though, because this list seemed a little empty without all of the athletic diversions of the Mario list. That guy really gets around. Sonic, though, usually stays out of sports. That's one thing I have in common with him. Well, that and the fact that I'm also not wearing trousers at the moment. Oh. Sega Superstars Tennis is a title in which superstars can only be interpreted sarcastically. There's Alex Kidd, some of the super monkeys from Super Monkey Ball, and Gilius Thunderhead from Golden Axe. Although that might be Gilius, but that's kind of my point really. I barely know who any of these people are. Sega, you've got bigger properties than this, you know. Your back catalogue doesn't just consist of Sonic and Other. The various modes here pull inspiration from more series, such as House of the Dead and, oh, Puyo Puyo again. And those modes are indeed the highlights. Otherwise, the game is mainly 
tennis. It's good tennis, but it's tennis. And if you don't already love tennis, it's not going to win you over. We know because we already don't love tennis. The DS version is surprisingly faithful to the console version, by the way. There are a few tweaks and it clearly looks worse, but it is an impressive feat and it's notable for that reason alone. Number 35, Sonic the Hedgehog Triple Trouble, 1994, Game Gear. It should come as no surprise that the best Sonic Game Gear game is the sequel to Sonic Chaos, the best Sonic Master System game. Triple Trouble doesn't quite rise to the heights of the best 2D Sonic games, but it comes remarkably close, especially considering the hardware. In fact, the hardware is about the only thing working against this one. The tiny screen of the Game Gear means you can't see very much at once, leading to cheap deaths. The speaker, as well, doesn't do justice to this game's great music. It still sounds rather good, we just want it to sound better because, I don't know, we're selfish, greedy even. Really, the game is fun, it's just that the limitations of the console hold it back. Triple Trouble could have been so much better realised on the Mega Drive. The sprites look nice, but not nice enough. The colourful environments are great, but those colours should pop so much more. The new ring system, in which you lose only some rings upon taking damage, because the Game Gear couldn't render them all, is an unfortunate concession, even if it was a necessary one. Triple Trouble is very good, to be clear, but that's also what's frustrating. Frustrating. If it's this good on a weak handheld, it could have been great on a console. Oh, except for that train boss at the end of Sunset Park. That thing can suck a very big egg. I apologise for that outburst. Number 34, Sonic the Hedgehog Pocket Adventure, 1999, Neo Geo Pocket Color. The joke that everybody makes about Sonic the Hedgehog Pocket Adventure is that it got a perfect score from IGN, as though that's inherently absurd. And, right, okay, it, it sort of is, but at the same time, context is important. This was a handheld game in 1999 that looked great, sounded great, ran great, and had a great sense of speed. Reviewers were comparing Pocket Adventure to handheld games that came before it. They couldn't have known how much better handheld games would eventually get. All of which is to say that Pocket Adventure is only good for a handheld game of its era, right? Well, no, it's a solid little platformer in its own right, and its biggest problem is how little of it there is. There are six main zones with two acts each, and then a handful of one-off zones. At the time of its release, this was completely understandable, but today you'll finish it before you even finish a cup of coffee. That is a valid topic for discussion, though. Is a great experience less great for being too short? Is a mediocre experience better if it lasts longer? Pocket Adventure can't really answer that question, as it stops being good once you reach Aero Base, which has a maze-like layout plagued by blind jumps, and it never really recovers from there. This game is fun, and it is impressive, but it doesn't maintain its quality through to the end. It's worth a play, but quit when you get to Aero Base. You have my permission. Number 33, Sonic Forces, 2017, PlayStation 4, Switch, Xbox One, and PC. Sonic Forces is both undeserving of its negative reputation and deserving at the same time. Undeserving because it tends to be lumped together with the very worst Sonic games, and as we've seen, that's simply not accurate. But deserving because it's still not all that good, to be honest. Coming just a few months after Sonic Mania, Sonic Forces was bound to be compared to it. Now that would be fine if it weren't for the fact that Sonic Mania represented the best game Sonic had starred in for ages. Even if it were very good, Sonic Forces would have come up wanting simply because it wasn't an all-time great. And it's, well, not an all-time great. It's sometimes dull and relies far too heavily on scripted sequences to feel satisfying, but there is some fun to be had here. Some of the bosses are impressive, the levels are revisited for new objectives, and, uh, well, some of the music is good. Okay, we are stretching now, but the point is that it's far from the worst game the series has ever had. The story is absolute crap, and this world already conquered by Eggman seems to have very little to do with Eggman, so there's a lot of squandered potential there, but on its own merits, it's a fine platformer. It's just kind of empty. The biggest innovation here is the customizable player avatar, which is actually quite fun. If only the story didn't try to be edgy and serious, the ability to play as your own custom homunculus would have been great. 
Number 32, Sonic the Hedgehog, 1993, Arcade. As we've seen, Sonic the Hedgehog has made a few appearances in the arcade, but something that often goes overlooked is the arcade port of his Mega Drive game. Well, it's not quite a port, mainly because of how much it's missing. The game only contains four zones, Green Hill, Spring Yard, Starlight, and Scrap Brain, with the latter losing a third of its content. Finish Scrap Brain Act 2, and you're taken directly to the final boss. Not that Scrap Brain Act 3 was anything people were hoping to revisit anytime soon, but it's interesting just how much Sega was willing to chop out of this game. Things were also made significantly more punishing, with tighter timers and a complete absence of one-ups. It's as though Sega took one look at their hit game and asked themselves, what if this was missing loads of content, was more difficult, and was less fun? It's tempting to dismiss these strange decisions as being somehow necessary for the game to work in an arcade setting. But there was also an arcade version of Sonic 2, and that was so similar to its Mega Drive equivalent that we aren't even ranking it separately. All of the zones were present, and aside from minor tweaks, the content didn't really change significantly. It did remove special stages, but otherwise it was the same experience as its console counterpart, only it was much less convenient and you had to play the entire thing standing up. Huh. Arcades kind of sucked, didn't they? Number 31, Sonic Riders Zero Gravity, 2008, PlayStation 2, and Wii. Sonic Riders was a good game, and it understandably had its supporters. A sequel could have been an easy win. After all, with racing games, you can just tweak the gameplay and add new tracks and characters, and fans are generally perfectly happy. They rarely want a sequel that shakes things up too much. They want a game they already enjoy, but bigger and better. That's not quite what we got here, though. The trick system in that game, which was necessary to achieve mastery, was massively simplified. Now you just press a button on a ramp, and watch the animation happen automatically. Even cornering and boosting have been reworked to be more automated, requiring less thought and resulting in less satisfaction. The outcome is a game that feels a bit shallow, with most of what made the first game interesting now taken out of our hands as players. It's not all bad, let's be clear. The game looks better, it controls well, when we're actually allowed to control it, the music is good, Silver and Blaze are welcome additions, and the selection of tracks is certainly fine, so it's far from a total disaster. It just seems like a step backwards for a series that had started out feeling so unique. There was a real opportunity here for Sonic Riders to grow into something special, and it was off to such an excellent start. But Zero Gravity is, ironically, where it started to fall, and we've already seen where it crash-landed. Number 30, Sonic Chaos, 1993, Master System. If you've heard anything positive about the Master System games, it was likely about Sonic Chaos, which is often referred to as an overlooked gem. Or emerald, probably. Point is, it's the one Sonic game from that console that people tend to speak about fondly. Is that deserved? Actually, yes. We may not be ranking it all that high on this list, but we can't deny that it is impressive. It looks better than its predecessors, its animations are smooth, and it's packed with features that everyone had assumed at various points that the Master System couldn't handle, such as the Spin Dash and being able to play as Tails. The latter was actually a headlining feature in Japan, where the game was called Sonic and Tails. All of that is great, but it's still not a patch on Sonic's best 2D platformers. The stages aren't all that well designed, though we have seen far worse. Also, the music is only passable, the bosses are mindless, and the game is very short. But really, this is by far the closest Sonic ever came on the Master System to the quality of the classic Mega Drive games. It's an interesting and admirable attempt. If it still comes up short, it's not for want of trying. The Game Gear version, released a month later, is the only version that Japan and North America got. It's not identical to this version, with some tweaks to the level design and boss behavior, but they're similar enough, and either one is worth a spin. Dash. A spin. A spin dash. Number 29, Sonic the Hedgehog 4, Episode 2, 2012, PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and PC. The worst thing about Sonic 4 Episode 1 being such crap is that few people were willing to play Episode 2, and that's unfortunate because it's actually far, far, far better than its predecessor. 
That still only makes it alright, of course, but if both episodes were on this level of quality, fewer people would try removing memories of Sonic 4 from their brains using ice picks. The zones are more unique, there are better stage gimmicks, and the buddy moves with Tails are genuinely good additions. Red star rings provide a reason to explore, the music is improved, and everything looks so much better. Also, whereas the previous game's bosses were all recycled, things are much more creative here. Episode 2's first boss pokes fun at the very idea of reusing bosses, and it's a great fake-out. Still, it's not all great, with half-pipe special stages feeling routine, and the Metal Sonic encounters being better in concept than in execution. Also, the the first act of Sky Fortress Zone is just Sky Chase Zone, failing to understand that brevity was what made Sky Chase work at all. But this game is a huge step up from its predecessor, and Episode 3 could have been better still. Alas, by this point, the Sonic 4 name was toxic, and the third episode was scrapped. That's Sega's fault for putting out a subpar first entry, to be clear, not the fans' fault for not giving this one a chance. It's worth wondering what might have been, though. Number 28, Sonic Colors, 2010, DS. If you liked the console version of Sonic Colors, the DS game of the same name will pale by comparison. If you disliked the console version, the DS version will probably still pale by comparison, to be honest, but we will be quick to praise it for one thing. It's a unique experience with completely different content and mostly different gameplay. That means that Sonic fans who bought both versions ended up experiencing next to no overlap. The story is similar, but here there's actually more going on. In the console game, Sonic and Tails roam Eggman's completely barren outer space amusement park. The DS version attempts to inject some life into the setting, with friends and rivals from Sonic's past exploring the park as well. In terms of gameplay, it's basically Sonic Rush 3. Now that's a good thing, because Sonic Rush was great, and we do not speak about Sonic Rush Adventure. The special stages are very similar to Sonic Rush's, without, sadly, that game's incredible music. Change my ways indeed. Yeah, change them back. The level design overall ranges from decent to appalling, with the last few stages in particular being home to multiple impossible to predict death traps in a row. But more of it is good than bad. All of which is to say that it doesn't measure up to either Sonic Rush or Sonic Colors, but it is fun enough and we admire that it played to the strengths of its hardware. It's just that the entire endeavor feels like a lesser shade of two better games. Number 27, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Winter Games, 2009 DS. Compared to Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games for the DS, and no, it's not difficult to keep the names of all 12 of these games straight, why do you ask? Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Winter Games for the DS is a big step forwards. For starters, they redesigned a number of events from the Wii version, as opposed to just porting them over as closely as possible and hoping for the best. There's still an expectedly heavy reliance on the touchscreen, but the controls are much better and don't just boil down to dragging the stylus back and forth. Well, they do boil down to that, but less frequently. The Dream events are a lot of fun too, with everything feeling significantly more varied than the minigames did in the previous release. All of that is enough to elevate Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Winter Games, but it's actually the story mode that really makes this one shine. Not only does it give players a reason to do more than plow through the minigames once, shrug, and trade it in, but it ended up being weirdly prescient. The game was released in 2009 in anticipation of the 2010 Vancouver Winter Olympics, and the story involves Eggman and Bowser sabotaging the games by capturing all of the snow spirits. Then, a lack of real-life snowfall similarly threatened the actual Winter Olympics in Vancouver. Now, I'm not blaming Eggman and Bowser, of course, that would be silly. Instead, I'm blaming you for not finishing the story mode. You could have stopped them. Number 26, Mario and Sonic at the London 2012 Olympic Games, 2012, 3DS. The 3DS was a bit more powerful than the DS, and the jump in processing power is especially clear when comparing Mario and Sonic at the London 2012 Olympic Games to its DS predecessors. Those games looked good enough, 
but this one looks genuinely impressive. It's also not lacking for content, with a frankly ludicrous 57 events to play. This wasn't just another Olympics game on a different handheld, Sega went out of its way to give us a lot of content for our money. Is it likely to win anyone over who didn't care about the previous Olympic Games? Definitely not, but it was enough to keep people interested in the subseries just a little longer. They also did their best to make the 3DS feel necessary to the experience. The touchscreen controls are still present and accounted for, but there are now plenty of new effects to show off the added depth and even some gyroscope controls. Your mileage on those may vary, but they worked well enough for us. They're a gimmick, absolutely, but they're implemented well enough that we won't kick up a fuss. Actually, wait, we just remembered that there are microphone inputs as well. We'll kick up a fuss about those any day of the week. We are giving this the edge over Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Winter Games on the DS, but not by much. So if you disagree, well, it's not likely anyone at Triple Jump will remember which of these games is which come tomorrow, so just pretend we preferred your favourite game instead, and we'll be none the wiser. Number 25, Sonic Generations 2011 3DS. The main version of Sonic Generations had one main gimmick. Fans could play stages from Sonic's history in both 2D classic and 3D modern styles. The 3DS version still has you playing as classic Sonic and modern Sonic, but the differences between the two are minor, and all of the stages are in 2D. That is to say that this game basically removes Sonic Generations USP from Sonic Generations. Oh, a bold strategy. The frustrating thing is that the 3DS version of Sonic Generations knows exactly what it should have done instead. Adapt levels from Sonic's handheld games. The console version reflects Sonic's console history, and so a trip through his handheld history here would have been great. And we know that the developers already had that idea for this version, because they included the Water Palace from Sonic Rush. We have no idea why they adapted only one handheld stage and took the rest from the console games, but that would have been a far better concept. They could even have divided it into three different eras. The Game Gear era, the GBA era, and the DS era. It would have given this version more of a reason to exist. What we got is not a bad game, to be clear, and it's nice that nearly all the stages are different from the ones in the console version. It's just that this game feels like a lesser imitation of that one, when it could have so easily served as a great complement to it. Number 24, Sonic Advance 3 2004, Game Boy Advance. Yes, our opinions are completely at odds with the critics when it comes to the Sonic Advance series. Overall, they felt that the games got better with each release, but we couldn't disagree more. All three games are certainly good, but the first was by far the best, with each of its sequels taking a few steps backwards from there. Sonic Advance 3 is far from a total loss, but we feel it's definitely the weakest owing to its two main innovations. The larger levels with hidden chows are often irritating to navigate, and due to the similarities of stage elements, it's almost impossible to remember where you've checked and where you haven't. Then there's the partner mechanic, which sees you pairing up two characters to use special abilities, but none of them are as fun as just playing the game. The previous Sonic Advance games built their levels in such a way that you could complete them with any character alone. This feels like a clunky and unnecessary complication to a formula that had already worked just fine. The levels themselves aren't as much fun either, and the soundtrack doesn't rise to the heights of the previous games, but Sonic Advance 3 isn't bad. It's not even close to bad, it's just a disappointment and puzzlingly overstuffed. If you're one of those fans who feels as though Sonic hasn't been good since the Mega Drive, the odds are you've been overlooking his handheld titles. Pick them up. Sonic stayed alive, well and happy much longer over there. Number 23, Sonic Colors 2010 Wii. Sonic Colors is one game that Sonic fans point to when they claim that not all modern Sonic games are bad. Then people who aren't Sonic fans play it and say, uh, 
yeah, it's fine, we suppose. Sonic games had earned such a toxic reputation that when Sonic Colors was strictly competent, it felt like a breath of fresh air. And yes, Sonic Colors is a highlight of the modern era of Sonic, but that means less that it was great and more that, you know, it didn't deliberately set your house on fire with all of your pets locked inside. The game is aggressively self-aware, which is grating rather than clever. The visuals are appropriately colourful and the soundtrack is very good, but the levels rarely achieve greatness. Also, the wisps are never useful outside of predetermined locations. Yeah, you can use them whenever you like, but unless that specific area is designed to interact with a wisp, there's no point. You'll find nothing. You never need to think or experiment. Also, just playing the game is enough to confuse it. Get behind an enemy and it won't be smart enough to turn around. Try to backtrack because you missed something and you'll usually hit an invisible wall. Try to jump over or around an obstacle in a way that the game doesn't expect and you'll often be forced into a sequence that plays itself because the game doesn't account for deviation. When it works, though, it works well and can be a lot of fun. It's just that it should work far more frequently than it actually does. Number 22. Sonic Generations 2011 PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and PC. Sonic Generations, the game so many people tend to cite as the last great Sonic game, isn't great. It's sometimes very good, and it's usually at least fine, but like Sonic Colors, it should be so much better than it is. The good. Well, the concept. Certainly, three stages each are pulled from the Mega Drive era, the Dreamcast era, and what Sega calls the modern era, because that's the politest way to describe it. And it doesn't shy away from Sonic stumbles. Sonic 06 gets a stage, and Shadow the Hedgehog gets a reference with the game's anti-hero holding that damned fourth Chaos Emerald. The rest is rather messy. The idea of providing 2D and 3D versions of each stage is undercut by the fact that the 3D stages are still, in large part, 2D. When they do allow 3D movement, it's often extremely limited. The 2D stages are presented as being in line with classic Sonic, but they don't look, sound, or feel much like classic Sonic ever did. There's also very little variety in the stages. Two are factory levels, and three are highway levels. Sonic is a vast and varied franchise, so there's no excuse for that. And the less said about that awful level from Sonic Colors, the better. We tried to like this one. We know this one is held in high regard. The odds are good that you enjoyed this game significantly more than we did. We love you, and we're happy for you. We just think the rest of these games were much better. Number 21. Sonic Riders 2006 GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Xbox When people hear Sonic and 2006 in close proximity, they, well, they usually start foaming and then fall over. But if they do manage to piece an actual thought together, it will be of Sonic 06, naturally. Rarely do they remember that Sonic got two other games that year, and one of them was quite good. Sonic Riders' gimmick is that you're racing on hoverboards and you need energy to stay afloat. Without it, you'll have to run along the ground while your opponents muck fly right past you. You can keep your energy flowing by using pit stops, which slow you down, or performing tricks. Of course, the game gets much more dull once you master the rhythm of tricking and boosting around each track, but competing with friends can keep this tight and tense. There's also a surprisingly involved story mode. Usually in racing games, the story mode is just an excuse to play through all of the tracks and maybe unlock other characters. Here, though, it unfolds across two playthroughs, similar to Sonic Adventure 2. You play through the hero story, and then you see what was happening from the villain's side. It's an interesting use of a mode that could easily have been filler. Also, and this is pretty vague criticism, so we apologise in advance, but there's something very strange to us about the new characters in this game being birds. We can't quite put our fingers on it. Sonic palling around with foxes, bats, armadillos and robots feels fine to us, but birds? Why, we just can't take that seriously. Number 20. Mario and Sonic at the London 2012 Olympic Games. 2011. Wii. The third release in this series of 12 games- wait, 12? Good God. Mario and Sonic at the London 2012 Olympic Games for the Wii is, in many ways, a reworked version of the first game, with both of them focusing on the Summer Olympics. That's a bit disappointing, as that game was not very good. Fortunately, Mario and Sonic at the London 2012 Olympic Games for the Wii took inspiration from Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Winter Games for the Wii, rather than Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games for the Wii, we think. Those are confusing names, okay? The game may technically repeat events from the first game, but it builds upon the superior presentation, controls, and charm of the second game, essentially rendering the first game obsolete. Which is good, because no human being needs 12 of these things. 
The dream events introduced in the previous game are also great and are arguably even better than they were there. We say it's arguable because if you prefer the athletic side of things here, you'll be let down. If you preferred the crossover madness side of things though, you'll be in heaven. Possibly literally, as we can't be sure that that's not what's happening here. And yes, we know the stage is based on Yoshi's story. I'm making a joke, you're watching a comedy channel. Relax a little, will you? There's also a London party mode, which we like because it's the only time we've ever been invited to anything by that name. Number 19. Team Sonic Racing 2019 PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. Team Sonic Racing is inferior to its much-loved predecessors, but its merits are notable, particularly in the form of its team mechanics. Winning races is, by and large, more than finishing first. It's about supporting your teammates so that all of you place well enough to outrank the other teams. And that's great! It's also greatly exaggerated, as most of the support you will provide is incidental. Certainly nobody can or should go out of their way to nudge teammates who are already far behind. Nobody is going to coast in any slipstreams unless they're already right behind someone else, and passing items back and forth is an easy mechanic to abuse in order to fill your ultimate meter. But even with the overblown team mechanics, it's a fun experience with some interesting wrinkles to the kart racing formula. There is one puzzling thing, however. Reportedly, the developers narrowed the focus of the roster here, removing the emissaries of other Sega games on the grounds that Sonic alone had a large enough cast. That's correct, but there are only 15 characters here, notably fewer than the previous games had. The idea surely should have been to provide a full roster of Sonic characters, right? Not a skimpy one? It's especially strange not because a large number of famous Sonic characters didn't make the cut, but because some deeply unloved ones did. It's a good racer with good ideas, but it also feels a bit slight and pales in comparison to its two predecessors. Number 18. Sonic Lost World 2013 3DS. Sonic Lost World just can't catch a break. Its main version on the Wii U was overshadowed by the dual perceptions that Sonic was bad and the Wii U was bad, meaning that few people gave it a chance. In truth, Lost World was good. It's not likely to be anyone's favourite Sonic game, but it's also far, far from the worst. The 3DS game had even less of a chance of being taken seriously, as it was seen as an inferior port of something nobody cared about in the first place. It's not, however. It's instead a completely different game. Every level is unique, built to feel at home on the 3DS in a way that works genuinely well. It's still fundamentally Lost World, but it harkens back to classic Sonic more often in its design. It sometimes seems like a throwback title that also manages to feel modern. Well, modern at the time, as it was ten years ago. It also runs extremely well on the tiny little handheld, which feels like actual wizardry. It's probably just good programming, but we don't understand programming, so we will call it wizardry and be very afraid. It even, surprisingly, has motion-controlled special stages that are actually fun. Yes, Sonic and motion controls at last came together to create something enjoyable, and the game is worth trying out for that novelty alone. Ultimately, fans willing to try Sonic Lost World have two completely different under appreciated games to enjoy, which is good because we're definitely not getting a sequel. Number 17. Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Winter Games 2009. We. The second game in the sub-series, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Winter Games represents a massive step forwards, and that's clear in all aspects of the experience. Superficially, the game looks and sounds much better. Granted, the previous game looked and sounded fine, and we aren't casting aspersions at its presentation, but there was another level of love invested in this one, and it shows. Dig a little deeper, and you'll find the events are better designed as well. You heard the word we correctly though, so you know that you'll be waggling yourself raw, but there's more variation in the way that events are played, and most of them work rather well. They're even, dare we say it, fun. As much as the previous game was content to coast on its novelty, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Winter Games does a really good job of making the minigames enjoyable in themselves. We know we're not asking for much here, but it's worth celebrating. Also worth celebrating? The Dream Events! And yes, we know that the previous game had Dream Events, but it only had four and they weren't particularly inventive or involved. Here, Dream Events serve as an excuse to combine athletics with a trip through the history of both franchises. They offer a real sense that this truly is a Mario and Sonic game as opposed to a game that features Mario and Sonic. They're a lot of fun, and starting here, they'd be a consistent highlight. Number 16. Sonic Heroes 2003 GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Xbox. Sonic Heroes is an excellent Rorschach test with your feelings about Sonic's 3D years being reflected back at you by whatever you see in the game. It's easy to focus on its glitches, dreadfully uneven stage design, and unnecessary bloat. It's just as easy, however, to focus on its incredible soundtrack, willingness to experiment, and just how much fun everything is when it works. Sonic Heroes! 
you're welcome. When the set pieces come together and the character specific sequences hit a rhythm, it's easy to get swept up in the giddy excitement and that does happen often enough that it's noteworthy. Then you end up in a stage like Bingo Highway or Bullet Station which feel interminably long and barely finished. The latter, in particular, drags on for ages with few checkpoints and many unfair deaths occurring because the grind rails didn't behave the way they should have. There's a carelessness behind the game that ultimately feels very disappointing because there are a lot of great ideas here and the ones that are executed well are too frequently followed by ones that are not. Plus, you need to play through it with four different teams, three of whom are functionally very similar just to get to the final story, and the final story is Pants. Sonic Heroes is a game with huge, glaring, upsetting flaws, but it does so much right. Ultimately, we feel like the many high points outweigh the significant lows, and yet, if you don't agree, we'd understand completely. Number 15. Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing 2010 DS, PlayStation 3, Wii, Xbox 360, and PC. It's safe to say that Sonic has been in a lot of rubbish racing games, but starting here, Sumo Digital hit upon a formula that took them in a much better direction. As in, they provided actual fun that a human being might experience. It was a crazy idea, but it paid off, and Sonic racing games have been at least very good ever since. Despite his headlining status, of course, Sonic is just one of many Sega characters to put in an appearance. You can also play as characters from Virtua Fighter, Fantasy Zone, Crazy Taxi, and and other great games, and also Shenmue. Different versions of the game had exclusive characters, but not enough of them to really make any version better than the others. It was a good game in all of its versions, with creative tracks and fun nods to the company's larger history. Even the DS version was impressively faithful to the console ones. There were some necessary concessions made for the less powerful hardware, but not enough in our eyes to relegate it to a separate entry, so we're covering it here as well. In fact, we might as well tip our hats to the later arcade version released in 2011, featuring some tweaks and in some locations a prize ticket dispenser. Unlike the Mario Kart arcade games though, this one was basically a port, so we're not giving it its own separate entry. It's just one more unique version of a really solid racer. Number 14. Sonic Advance 2 2002 Game Boy Advance. There's a lot to enjoy in Sonic Advance 2, even if it doesn't quite measure up to the first Sonic Advance. This one looks better and has an improved sense of speed, which was already quite solid in the first game. It also adds Cream the Rabbit, bringing the total playable characters to five, which is impressive. The game itself, however, isn't quite as well designed. It relies more on blind jumps and impossible to foresee hazards, which work against the speed that the game tries so hard to refine. The levels have interesting theming, Music Plant and Techno Bass in particular, but they don't always live up to their own potential. Things are unnecessarily complicated as well. Sonic Advance 2 includes a homing attack, which is utterly unnecessary in 2D and is activated the same way as the Insta Shield, leading to easy mistakes. What's more, to enter the special stages, you need to explore each level thoroughly and find small collectibles, which is tedious even when you know where they are. The boss fights creatively take place while running, but the creativity isn't worth the headache as it's far more difficult to manage your distance from Eggman. All of which is to say that, no, it's not as good as the first Sonic Advance and its sloppiness is is difficult to ignore. If you do manage to overlook it though, you end up with a fast and fun adventure that is among the best looking games on the system. We just wish it got a little more time in the oven. Number 13. Sonic Unleashed 2008 PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, Wii, and Xbox 360 We'll say this up front, the game about Sonic the Hedgehog becoming a werewolf is far better than it should have been. Or, well, a werehog, because Sega couldn't work out which half of the word werewolf meant wolf. It's the wolf half, for the record. It makes sense that Sega would have wanted to shake up the formula after a series of critically derided games, but was making Sonic slower and clunkier with unrecognisable beat-em-up gameplay really the best idea? The werehog sections drag this game down as they're rarely difficult and frequently overlong. The thing about a werewolf, though, is that it's only a wolf at night. In the daytime sections of Sonic Unleashed, Sonic runs through some of the best stages in any of his 3D games. They look great, the music is incredible, and they are genuinely a lot of fun. They're also over in the blink of an eye, which makes it feel like Sega didn't trust them to carry a game on their own. That's unfortunate, because they're the clear highlight, and this one would rank much higher if it had more of them. Sonic Unleashed is not quite the same game across platforms, but we didn't think the two versions were different enough to warrant their own entries. The Wii and PS2 versions are inferior, and the increased percentage of nighttime levels doesn't help, but still, it's a good game wherever you played it. It's just that it could have been a much better game wherever you played it. Number 12. Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed 2012 PlayStation 3, Vita, Wii U, and Xbox 360 Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed is the best Sonic racing game. We realise that's like calling a chicken sandwich the best chicken sandwich, because it's one of very few chicken sandwiches that didn't cause you a full night of violent plops, but still, it's not the chicken sandwich's fault that the previous chicken sandwiches set the bar so low. 
In related news, I'm very hungry for a chicken sandwich. The game basically takes everything that worked from Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing and builds upon it with better tracks, new characters, and a transformation mechanic that allows the same vehicles to race on land, sea, and air. And it did that before Mario Kart 8, which is impressive. Where's our Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed Deluxe, Sega? This is also the only game in the history of humanity that allows you to pit Danica Patrick against Mimi the Monkey to determine, conclusively, the better driver. Frankly, we'd have ranked Sonic Boom so much higher if it had somehow allowed us to do that. The PC and 3DS ports were released just a bit later, so we aren't counting those, but it is worth mentioning that PC gamers got to enjoy exclusive characters from Team Fortress 2, Company of Heroes 2, Rome 2, and Football Manager 2. 012, 2012. It's an excellent, well-refined racer that deserves its strong reputation. I mean, good luck finding anyone playing it online today, but we have to admit, it was fun while it lasted. Number 11. Sonic Lost World 2013 Wii U Look, our writer knows full well that he's not going to change your mind about Sonic Lost World. All he wants to do is tell you why he loves it. He wants to gush about the incredible soundtrack. He wants to draw your attention to the lovely visuals, which might have the best art direction outside of the 2D games. He wants to tell you about the deceptive depth of the movement mechanics. He knows that you've already come to a decision about this game. He's comfortable with that. He knows you're already typing a comment that says, Play better things. He knows all of that and he still tries. And that is the saddest thing of all. Joking aside, Sonic Lost World is worth another look. The Deadly Six aren't anywhere near the memorable villains they should be, the level design isn't perfect, and it's weirdly difficult to get a hang of the controls. Those are all fair criticisms. But once things click, when you're bounding around some of the most lovingly crafted environments in the series, it can feel rather magical, and it comes closer to capturing the charming atmosphere of the original games than it actually gets credit for. If you're looking for the best Sonic game, well, yeah, keep looking. But if you're just trying to sample a few entries from across his career, our writer encourages you to give this one a shot. Now, he suffered through the edutainment games for you, so surely you can do this much for him. Number 10. Sonic Adventure 2 2001 Dreamcast both Sonic Adventure games do certain things very well, and other things very poorly. Different fans will put different weightings on those pros and cons, as they should, but we think that Sonic Adventure 2 is the one that comes up short. Instead of the six overlapping stories of the first game, we get two here. There are still six playable characters, but far less is done with the conflicting viewpoints concept. The varying gameplay styles of Sonic Adventure 1 were not created equal, but here we get one main style and just two bits of extended filler. Sonic and Shadow have stages built for speed, which is great, but Knuckles and Rouge's treasure hunting is even more tedious now. And you don't so much as control Tails and Eggman as you do the little mechs that they sit in. It's fine, but it just makes you want to get back to Sonic or Shadow in a stage that you might actually enjoy. Also, when Sonic and Shadow turn super, they do this. And we feel as though someone, somewhere, should have prevented that. There's still a lot to love, though. The soundtrack isn't as strong as the first games, but it's no slouch. The writing is better, the animation is better, and the voice acting is better, even if the English lines step over each other due to amateurish editing. As a swan song for the underloved Dreamcast, it's hard to ask for more, though. A third game could have ironed out the wrinkles and truly delivered on the Sonic Adventure promise, but it was never to be. Number 9. Sonic the Hedgehog 1991 Mega Drive the debate continues about whether Sonic 2 or Sonic 3 is the best game of the Mega Drive trilogy, but you won't find too many people arguing that the first Sonic is the best one. That's because its flaws are glaring enough that even the biggest fans can't overlook them, especially since they were all addressed, to some degree, in the very next game. Design-wise, it's all over the place. Even the game's much-vaunted sense of speed is only really on display in Green Hill Zone, and then just barely resurfaces for bits of spring Yard and Starlight Zones. The game jerks from open and frantic to tight and demanding on a dime, and it does so in a way that's more frustrating than interesting. 
and yet clearly the game did so much right. It has some of gaming's most iconic visuals, the soundtrack is phenomenal, and its Mega Drive sequels would still only get better in that regard. The physics are excellent, even if they do take a bit of getting used to, and when everything slips into place, the speed, the design, the visuals, the music, it feels just a little bit like magic. It was, and remains, an extraordinarily strong first outing. No, Sega didn't create a perfect game right out of the gate, nor could they have been expected to, but they came closer than they had any right to come. Number 8. Sonic the Hedgehog 3 1994 Mega Drive Which is better, Sonic 2 or Sonic 3 and or Knuckles? The debate continues and always will, but for the purposes of this list, we don't have to worry about the answer. Oh well, that was nice while it lasted. It would be wonderful to think that Benevolent Sega released this and Sonic and & Knuckles separately because it was too big for a single cartridge, but according to Yuji Naka himself, it was really because they'd made a deal with McDonald's that required Sega to have the game on shelves sooner. They cobbled together what they completed and just called it Sonic 3, pushing everything else to a later release. It shows, and Sonic 3 feels very much unfinished. It's full of insta-death hazards, and the difficulty often feels artificial. There are issues with slowdown and collision detection, and it feels uneven, with some acts moving at a brisk pace, and others feeling like they never end. In short, it often feels like what it is, a half-finished game full of ideas that nobody had time to implement well enough. Later games made it clear that Sega is in the habit of releasing things before they're finished, but that habit started here, in the third game proper. It's far from bad, some of the music is great, the special stages are better than the ones in the previous games, and environmental shields are a genuinely great idea. Oh, and Knuckles, the red one, he's here. It's quite good, but it's no masterpiece, but don't worry, the second half of the game is. Number 7. Sonic the Hedgehog CD 1993 Mega CD Yuji Naka and Naoto Ashima were two of the most important figures in the creation and design of the first game. Then they focused on two different projects. Naka lent his talents to Sonic 2, while Ashima headed up Sonic CD. Here, Eggman has decided to bring his particular brand of mechanized oppression to another world, and he got enough of a head start that the planet is doomed to fall into ruin. That's not just the backstory, that's the setup for Sonic CD's gameplay. You begin each zone in the present, and you can travel through time to see what becomes of things or change history. Each main level has a past, present, good future, and bad future iteration. It's like a Christmas Carol if Charles Dickens was a furry. Sonic CD had great ideas, but inconsistent execution. For instance, there's only ever a reason to go back in time, as that's how you destroy Eggman's gizmos and save the world. Sort of defeats the purpose of having four versions of each level, doesn't it? Then there's the time travel itself. It requires Sonic to run at top speed for several unbroken seconds, because Oshima, like the rest of us, watched Back to the Future, but it's too easy to be interrupted, cancelling your time jump. So why is Sonic CD ranked so high? Well, because it's still an incredibly fun platformer with memorable levels and some of the best music in the series. Not all of its ideas work, but the ones that do elevate it to being a highlight. Number 6. Sonic Advance 2001 Game Boy Advance you either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. That quote is from my favourite film, Sonic and the Dark Knight, and it summarises how it must have felt for Sega to release their first original Sonic game for Nintendo hardware. The two companies were legendarily at each other's throats, and then suddenly, one had no choice but to partner with the other for survival. Fortunately for fans, Sonic Advance is genuinely great. It had its issues, mainly in terms of the final few stages requiring leaps of faith and memorization of stage layouts, as well as a final boss that's most comfortably defeated by abusing invincibility frames, but our nitpicks are minor and are balanced out by what the game does well. 
Sonic Advance looks great, the music is wonderful, and the maze-like Egg Rocket Zone manages to ramp up the tension in a way that feels impressively climactic. You also get to play as Amy Rose, who is more than just a palette swap. She controls entirely differently, and relies on melee combat rather than hopping on enemies' heads, making her journey through the game feel fresh and unique. If you're curious, this was ported to the N-Gage and retitled Sonic N. It's just a straight port, but we wanted to point it out because A, it has the unique title and might otherwise cause confusion, and B, it's the stinkiest of stinky rubbish and we are glad they renamed it so it wouldn't tarnish the good name of Sonic Advance. Number 5. Sonic Adventure 1998 Dreamcast Had a difficult transition to 3D is probably the phrase that most often follows the word Sonic in the whole of the English language. But what if we told you that that weren't true? Well, we'd be lying, obviously, we've seen the evidence. But the first proper attempt to bring the series into 3D, Sonic Adventure, basically nailed it. It's not without its flaws, but it's surprising, in retrospect, after so many later games have struggled, how much it got correct out of the gate. The characters control well, the levels are memorable and provide opportunities for both speed and exploration, the soundtrack is phenomenal, and the story is… well, it's not good, no, but it's told in an interesting way, with six distinct campaigns that overlap at key points. And then you get an epilogue to pull everything together and resolve the central threat satisfyingly. All of that is great, and its flaws aren't even all that damning. Admittedly, the campaigns were far from created equal. Sonic's campaign was the understandable highlight, but Tails' campaign, disappointingly, was basically the same thing, only shorter. Knuckles was relegated to a few rounds of Hot and Cold, E-102 Gamma and Amy both added impressive variety but their stories were brief, and Big the Cat's campaign seemed to be designed to help you develop real-life anger management issues. Overall, though, little of that matters when the game is so much fun. This was a solid debut for 3D Sonic, and it's not this game's fault that later titles struggled. Number 4. Sonic Rush 2005 DS The first of nine Sonic games on the DS, Sonic Rush isn't just a highlight of that batch, it's a highlight of Sonic's 2D games overall, and that is a high bar. Coming off the excellent Sonic Advance series, developer Dimps outdid themselves in every way with this one. It improves on the sense of speed, it cranks the bright visuals up even higher, and it positively wipes the floor with the soundtracks from those games. In fact, Sonic Rush is a genuine contender for the best soundtrack in the series. The CEO of Funky Fresh Beats himself, Hideki Naganuma, bestowed upon the game an incredible selection of danceable earworms. Naganuma is best known for his work on Jet Set Radio and its sequel, and his work here is a standout element of an already excellent game. The stages are massive and varied, with multiple paths that help things stay fresh for another playthrough. That's good, because to unlock the true ending, you must play the stages in a different sequence as Blaze the Cat. The story is pants, of course, but if you play Sonic games for the story… man, go and read an actual book or something. They, they have better stories, usually. Granted, some of the levels are easy to get lost in, the final couple of zones just about manage to overstay their welcome, and the bosses are far more tedious than they are challenging, with long stretches of downtime between opportunities to attack. But we are picking nits, because on the whole, this is one of Sonic's best post-Mega Drive games. It's absolutely worth picking up if you overlooked it, so go on, spoil yourself. Number 3. Sonic & Knuckles 1994 Mega Drive The debate between Sonic 2 and Sonic 3 is, in our opinion, not a debate at all. A brilliantly designed fun adventure with some flaws, or an inconsistently designed flawed adventure with some brilliance. The real debate, we think, should be between Sonic 2 and Sonic and & Knuckles. Compared to Sonic 3, Sonic & Knuckles looks better, plays better, has better music, better design, better balance between set pieces and gameplay, much lower reliance on beginner's traps, and is just all around more fun. 
Sonic & Knuckles even features lock-on technology, allowing you to connect it to Sonic 3 and play both games straight through. Now that's a good idea, and doing this will actually update Sonic 3's levels and fix design issues, obscuring as best it can the fact that that game was never finished. Even if we considered Sonic 3 and Sonic & Knuckles as one entity, it's clear that the Sonic & Knuckles parts of the game are significantly better, and aside from Angel Island Zone and Hydro City Zone, this half of the game has all of the best content to itself. Sonic 3 can take Sandopolis Zone though, that one stinks. If they really are two halves of one game, then one half is far more worthy of your time than the other. It works to the credit of Sonic & Knuckles that they were released separately, because Happy Meal Toys be damned, this is the worthier successor to Sonic the Hedgehog 2. And speaking of Sonic the Hedgehog 2, number 2, Sonic the Hedgehog 2, 1992, Mega Drive. Sonic the Hedgehog positioned Sega as a serious competitor in the home gaming market for the first time ever, despite having released two previous consoles. Its first proper sequel then had a lot to live up to. How lucky for us all then that Sonic 2 was flipping brilliant. The game looks better, the levels are more varied, the speed is increased, and the soundtrack is legendary. Whether it's better than the first game's soundtrack is a matter of opinion, and this is our script, full of our opinions, so yes, yes it is. The first game had six proper zones, not counting special stages and final acts. This game has ten, and every one of them is better designed and more fun than what we had before. Things aren't always perfect here, but when they're not, they're still quite close. Even Sky Chase Zone, which is an auto-scroller, feels welcome, simply because it serves as a chance to catch your breath between the two most hectic zones in the game. If we have any complaints, um, it's that Metropolis Zone drags a bit, Hilltop Zone's music deserved a better level, Casino Night Zone set unrealistic beauty standards for Casino Zones to come, really there's very little fault to find anywhere here, and the introductions of Tails and the Spin Dash feel less like new additions and more like things that should have been there all along. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 has a very strong claim to being the best game of its generation. 90% of it is 2D platforming perfection, and the remaining 10% is still platforming greatness. And in our opinion, it's only been beaten once. And what beat it? Well, I'm sure Ben is just about to tell you. Number 1. Sonic Mania 2017 Switch, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC Sonic Mania is the best Sonic game ever made. It is a wonderful, loving, near-flawless reimagining of the earliest Sonic titles that still features unique level designs, gimmicks, and improvements throughout. It's both fresh and familiar, and it feels as though it came from a place of sincere adoration. Many fans feel similarly about Generations, and that is completely fair. That's a good game, but in our opinion, it doesn't hold a candle to this one. Development was led by Christian Whitehead, who had earned a name for himself in the Sonic fan game community. He he and the rest of his team, including musician T. Lopes, brought their many years of love, experience, and understanding of the franchise to the project, and created something truly special, reimagining famous elements of the previous games while building on them in ways that felt natural and appropriate. It's true that much of Sonic Mania consists of existing content, but it's presented and reconstructed in novel ways. In fact, one of the great things about playing it is that you can then return to the older games and see for yourself just how much this game improves on them. Every Everything in Sonic Mania feels right, and in our opinion, is right. It could still probably do with some small improvements, of course. Titanic Monic Zone drags a bit, Lava Reef Zone isn't much more fun here than it was the first time around, and another fully original zone or two would have been welcome, but any quote-unquote negative thing we could say about Sonic Mania really just comes down to the things we'd like to see ironed out in the sequel. We are getting a sequel, right, Sega? This was the best ever game from your biggest franchise. Surely we're getting a sequel. Sega? Hello? Stop pretending you can't hear us. 